We've all heard of the Tinder swindler, but William Allen Jordan is far worse. This man had dozens of wives and fiancés all at the same time, lying to them while he fathered dozens of children with them, conning them out of millions. He committed so many crimes against these women, including molesting one of their children. And today, one of his victims shares her story on the True Jody podcast. I thought I was getting to know him. He was researching me. He sent a dozen roses to my work, treated me like an absolute princess, proposed to me within two weeks of meeting him. And he sat down and he said, right, I've been given permission to tell you. I work for the official Department of Central Intelligence, more commonly known as the CIA. He ran across somebody who he had previously turned as an asset, the people that kind of flew their planes in the Twin Towers, and now knew where his wife and his kids lived. They were either going to kidnap the kids and rip bits of them and sell them through the post to us, or we had to come up with money. I sold my flat, I sold my life insurance, I sold my car, I sold my piano, I sold everything. It was £198,000. It also turned out he'd taken credit cards out of my name, so I was actually left with £56,000 worth of debt. And then I got a phone call from him saying that he'd been arrested because one of his fiancés, he'd used her credit card to pay for the car to get repaired without her permission. So she'd set up a police thing and then he was also charged with not registering his address under the Sex Offenders Act because he also turns out to be a convicted paedophile. Whoa. And now, a word from our sponsors. If you're looking for the perfect gift to give yourself this Christmas or one of your friends, then you've got to go to manscaped.com and use the code TRUE at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. You know why? Because they've just released the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, which is the perfect stocking filler. Give the gift of good hygiene, starting with the Lawnmower 5.0. Known as the best ball trimmer of all time, the Electric Razor's advanced skin safe technology is a lifesaver. Known for reducing nicks and cuts on Santa's sack. You get it, because... <laughs> and then a massive balls as well. Santa's also got a beard, so he's in luck, because we're also going to give him the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. And it also comes with the Handyman Electric Face Shaver for all his facial hair needs. And while we're at it, we'll throw in the Weed Whacker 2.0 Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer, along with the Manscaped Boxer Shorts and the Nail Grooming Kit. So don't forget to go to manscaped.com and use the code TRUE, that's T-R-U-E, at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. But for now, enjoy the video. Today on the True Jody podcast, we have one hell of a story. Um, this book here by Mary Turner Thompson, the psychopath, has inspired this interview. Uh, what what a what a story! What a read! And uh, thanks for coming on the show, Mary. Thanks for having me. Um, they've just made a documentary about your story, and I think people will naturally kind of compare it to the closest story we've heard of something similar would be the Tinder swindler maybe like yeah. you know you have a man in your life romantically involved who is a complete and utter con man uh, but this for me is potentially well worse because multiple children were created by this man under false pretenses millions had been taken from many women so let's go back to the start when when you met this man sure. what was your life like just before he entered it so we can kind of get a picture of that okay. so as a single mum, I had a, a nine-month-old baby, um, so that the relationship with her dad hadn't worked out. Um, so I was on my own. I was professional. I was busy. I was professional busybody. Mm. I would literally go into people's companies and tell them how to run them better. Mm. I had my own car. I had my own flat. Uh, owned my own place. You know, etc. My daughter was going to nursery, and I was going to work full time. Everything was. Brilliant. Everything was fine. I was I was very settled. I was very financially secure. Um, the only thing was that I didn't have a romantic partner. Mm -hmm. And my friends all said, you know, why don't you try this new internet dating thing? This is in the year 2000. Just come out. Yeah. You know, people were going, oh, yes, I've met somebody on the internet. And, and what could possibly go wrong? From memory... It, it, you weren't really into that whole thing and you sort of left, but you left your profile on there. But, I mean, no, I didn't leave it up. I, I cancelled the account, but they left it up. So I didn't. I wasn't even aware it was there. Um, and then I got this this message from this guy that was just, um, you know, said his name was Will Jordan, that he was a uh, mixed race, that he was American, that he had a bad bout of mumps as a child, so he couldn't have kids. So as a result, he spent his life chasing his career around the globe and, you know, that he was very, very into his work, but you know, he just you know, he he'd never really had space in his life for romance, you know. So he'd had a few relationships, but you know, etc. And just just very very chatty message, and I just sort of messaged back, and we got talking, and yeah, just as a family. professional woman yourself hmm. who has a child, 
he, he's saying, oh, well, I can't have kids. So you're like, oh, well, I do have a child. And a lot of the time for single mothers, it is hard meeting, meeting men because men are very territorial and that's not the ideal scenario for them. So this kind of was a pretty good situation. It is. I mean, yeah. it's ideal, really, yeah. actually. When you when you, your priority as a single mom is your child. Mm. You know, so you want to have somebody who's going to... It's not, you, When you're single, you're looking for the bad boys. I'm not everybody. This is my my experience, yeah. I should say. But you're looking for the, the you know the thrill, the the, the yeah. you know the fun seeker and everything else. When you become a mum, you're looking for Mister Reliable. You're looking for somebody who's going to make you know th- that's going to give your child a good example yeah. of who they should date. Someone competent, got their shit together. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like it's just very different when you when you uh, just your whole life changes when yeah. you have a kid. You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, he and he was ticking all those boxes. You know, mm. he wasn't he wasn't Mister Exciting. You know, he. He was he was just Joe Average, but he was he was just solid. That, that's what for yeah. me when looking into your story mm-hmm. hit me more. It's like you know the, you look at the Tinder swindler. Mm. When watching that back, like a lot of people, are like how did they not say something was up? Whereas this guy was far more ordinary and therefore yeah. far more dangerous, in my opinion, far more easier to go under the radar. I mean, had he been super super good looking or super suave or anything mm. else, no, he wouldn't. It wouldn't have worked because you would have just gone and gone. Hang on, that's not right. You know. Yeah. But, so you get you guys start. Um, getting on mm-hmm. and how long before it went from hey we've just started dating to oh this is quite serious this we met in about two weeks um, and then but I mean immediately after we met you know he was talking you know that he, that he was he was smitten um, that he was really surprised by the strength of his feelings things like that so it was it was all going a little bit faster than I was comfortable with not not uncomfortable with but just pulling me that little bit off balance um, and then but, is this what they call like love bombing yeah this is love bombing yeah. I mean he sent he sent a dozen roses to my work um, that's trying hard yeah, yeah and it's like and I, I hadn't told anyone at work I was dating anyone so there was kind of like that kind of what <laughs> what's going on here you know because he's like, letting every man in that office know yeah <laughs> oh she's mine now <laughs> Was there any other things he did other than the dozen roses? Was there other things he said very Gosh, quickly? Yes. I mean, he, he used to open doors. He used to walk on the roadside. He was quite old fashioned in his manners, with mm. very kind of Southern American kind of manners. Um, you know, so very sort of treated me like an absolute princess. You know, so you, you just felt you, you felt like you were being put on this pedestal mm. uh, and sort of like you know slightly worshipped, um, but not and not in a kind of. Not in a creepy way, yeah. Um, and it's very subtle, and it's very, yeah. It's it it is kind of hard to explain, but just, I mean, I don't want to don't know whether I want to jump ahead at all, but you know, having had the the conversations with the other women, I know that each one of us had a different experience. He wasn't just doing a kind of one size fits all thing. Wow. It was like he was being the perfect man for each of us. Wow. So there were some of he those... He was making a bespoke program. Oh, oh, yeah. He was, t- he was thinking, like psychologically analyzing you going, okay. what does she need? Totally. And I am going to be that guy perfect. just to you yes. bespoke. Yes. Damn. So in, in my case, I, I, I will not have, because, because of my, uh, my eldest daughter's dad, I will not have a man yell at me, all right? Because it's that's that's a deal breaker to me. Mm-hmm. Because I'd, I'd been there, done that, not happening again, exactly. right? So it, that and he was he never raised his voice, never, never sort of had you know. If we we would have arguments, we would have deep conversations, but they wouldn't be argue, they wouldn't be shouting. Right. There must have been a lot of conversation hmm. in where he asked so many questions about you to start off with. Well, that that was the the initial stage. The two mm. the two weeks we were talking online, I thought I was getting to know him. He was researching me, so it's like whilst whilst I was talking to him and we were talking about the books we'd read, and I said, "Oh, I've read this one," and he go, "Oh, that's that's that." And he was obviously going off and reading that book or you know researching it mm. or whatever. Um, and so he was getting all my philosophy, all my you know my my politics, my philosophy, my ideas, my you know etc. So he he literally was going okay that that element this element you know and putting putting together this chameleon package absolutely that was the ideal man for me 
This is why it's so important to, for for women out there to not give your cards away early on when you meet a guy because yeah. you know if a man is let's just take it from, out of this if a man just wants to sleep with a woman yeah he's do like a lot of men do this same game but just to get to that point yes um, and you're never actually going to find the right person for you by telling them what to be yeah so I think as as women there's a smart move to go don't tell him you ask the questions don't yeah. let him figure you out because yeah. if, once we figure a woman out men well you know what we want don't we not all psychopaths are men oh not at all Um, trust me if there's anyone who's aware of that (laughs) you're looking at them damn (laughs) so it's I mean it's uh, that the but by the way the theory is that only one in four psychopaths are female but actually I think it's 50 50 I I absolutely think it's 50 50 I think women are much better at hiding it dude that's that is so true because I think men are prone and we are going to go off topic for sure men are prone to being violent when they're mm-hmm. when they're trying to take someone down and it's often lashing out not well thought out women are so much more calculated than yeah. men because they have to be they're not big and strong yeah. so they use what they've got and they're actually better at it than men are um, so absolutely I agree with you but and I respect you for having the ability to say that when yeah. you've had something so bad uh, done to you by a man because it is hard um, when you've been hurt so much to uh, no, it's, you know, yeah, the thing is I mean I've done 17 years of research and psychopathy mm. and it's like I don't see myself as having been hurt by a man I see myself as having been hurt by a psychopath very you know good. and that's that's you know because otherwise you just tar all men with the same brush and I mm. have a son I don't want that to happen mm. um, you know so it's like and I know I know not all men are, are psychopaths it's, mm-hmm. not, it's nonsense to think so going back to your story with mm. this guy um, so it's it's it, he's playing the perfect game yes right now and um, at what point did you feel like the feelings were completely reciprocated and you were like yeah this is this is for me this I it, do you know I blame rom-coms <laughs> you know, it's like all that what we're talking about, the love bombing and everything else, is that these rom coms set us up to believe. And I grew up thinking, I was a romantic, grew up believing that one day you'd meet the one, you know, you would just be in love and, yeah. you know, sort of no matter what happened, you'd stick it, you know, you know. Um, and so it, that that's what I was presented with, was this person who was going to look after me, look after my child, um, that absolutely adored me, that, that got on well with my child, you know, just, just, that kind of whole package deal. Was the fire know? there as well between you? Did you feel that there was yeah. that fire chemistry? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was very much so. Uh-huh. Um, and just, yeah, just it, it was it was literally like something out of a rom-com. Mm. Uh, deliberately. I mean, literally, deliberately designed to be exactly that. A lot of women could fall victim to something yeah. like this. It's just how far it goes and how deep it went. Yeah. And obviously you were really committed. So yeah. at what point was marriage and things like that presented? He proposed to me within two weeks of meeting him. Wow. So uh, he stood me up <laughs> the night before. Mm. So we were supposed to be going down to London to see, uh, from Edinburgh to go to London to see the Phantom of the Opera. No, it wasn't actually. Sorry, I beg your pardon. We were going down for a party. Right. And I was going to meet all his work colleagues. So I was very excited to sort of meet, meet his work colleagues. And uh, he said he was on his way, he's on his way, he's on his way. And then, you know, sort of like, oh, we'll get a later flight and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And my daughter was at my mum's so that we could, we could have this trip away. Uh, and, uh, and this was on the, like, the 23rd of December or something. So you're meeting him? Yeah. Well, I, was, I was waiting at the flat for him to turn up uh-huh. uh, and go away for this, for this, um, um, trip away and uh, and he didn't turn up so I ended up drinking a bottle of wine going to bed and sort of I don't know, thinking I'll go get my no phone call no nothing well no it, it just it just it, he had said I'm delayed I'm delayed I'm delayed and then just nothing right and I just I just um, I'm not putting up with that kind of behavior, you know. Um, so in the morning, I was like, "That we're done. You know, it's not happening. You know, so I've only been seeing this guy two weeks, you know, et cetera. Um, and uh, seven o'clock in the morning, he turns up and, uh, and with, a, with a white teddy bear. And, um, and I was standing with my arms crossed and my legs crossed, leaning against the, the, the cooker, actually, sort of in the process of dumping him and just saying, this is not acceptable. No, uh-huh. you know. And he was like, I'm so really sorry, I was in a, um, a basement 
basement server area. He's an IT guy. Um, so it was a basement server area and I couldn't get away. And, you know, sort of like there was no signal and the you know, whole system crashed and, you know, sort of clients were having real problems and all these kind of things going on. I bet you elaborated, like he, he laid it on well thick. Oh, yeah. All more details at you as well. Mm. I bet you everything was very specific because mm-hmm. that's the, the more believable it becomes then because yeah. he's painting that picture. Yeah. yeah. And I was just, and the whole thing as well was, oh, you know, because I've, because I've spent so long in my life working and not being in a relationship, I'm I'm used to work coming first. You know, I have to get used to to switching that around. Um, and I was still going, no, 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 you know, this is just not on, this is not right behavior. Um, and then he said, well, I'm really upset too because I was planning to do something. And I was like, do what? And he handed me the teddy bear and around its neck was a diamond ring. And I was just like, what? You know, it wasn't like I sat there going, oh, how lovely, let's get married. Yeah. Mm. I was, I was just like, it just, it, it, I mean, it's, it was a seismic shift in the conversation because he just proposed to me. And I, I suddenly, I'm in the middle of dumping him and suddenly I'm, I'm now going, I mean, it was an obvious no, but at the same time, it, it, it transcended that from being the relationship is over to, well, I'm hurting your feelings by saying no to you marrying you so you know obviously when you, somebody stands you up it, it, it it's because you, you assume it's because they don't care they're not interested. They're uh-huh. they're they're being. He's uh, contradicting everything you felt yeah. in that moment. He's he's showing and, you I do care. Yeah, and it's so it's, it's <laughs> actions, you know, and and a proposal of marriage when he's just stood you up. It's just it just it's so incongruent. Your brain can't can't make that connection, uh-huh. and you know. So I obviously said no, and uh, but you know, sort of like so we've only known each other two weeks, and you know, just, but, he, but he was back in the game, was he? He was back in the game, yeah. Yeah, a woman being proposed to is a defining moment in her life, and like clearly now we can unpack this and look back at it and go, he was scrambling and he thought, all right, she's going to be pissed. I've got the answer for this, hmm. but it's a huge thing and it is powerful yeah. and it would have had an impact on you in that moment to, to forgive him at least I suppose yeah but it was seven o'clock in the morning he already had the ring so he hadn't that morning gone out and gone alright I'll sidetrack her he had the ring the day before uh-huh. so the whole thing was actually planned I wonder to what degree because this guy seems like the type we'd have like 10 rings in a, in a you know what I mean? Like, yeah, very possibly. Like this guy is, you just don't know how far the lengths are. Yeah. And the ring was the right size, by the way. Wow. <laughs> so you just kind of go, you know, so like, he, has he done it so often? Um, you know, that, yeah, he, he just has to go to the woman's finger yeah, and go, she's a kid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is a joke, man. Okay, so uh, at that point, he's back in the game. And we, where do we go from there then? So we, we carried on dating. Um, probably about three months ago past. Um, he has this thing of standing me up and you know sort of like not turning up to things and I mean things like going out to my my brothers for dinner um and you know my brother's finally going to get to meet him and then suddenly it's last minute he's been called away for work and I have to go I mean, it's humiliating mm. to turn up and something about well, he hasn't you know and it's like my, to the point that some of my friends and family started calling him my imaginary boyfriend oh yeah that hurts you know That's that was just so... like mm. you know so it's like things like when he did send you know the the, the flowers to work and stuff like that you know, I, I was wondering whether people was thinking I'm I'm sending, <laughs> sending them to myself. Them to <laughs> it was just it was just uh, it, and that that's gaslighting, love bombing, gaslighting. That's how it works, you know, because the gaslighting on its own doesn't work because it just it just it's just constant praise and everything else. What you have to do is you you belittle the person, you make them feel like they're going mad, you know, because that 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 a disconnect with what they're saying and what they're doing, you know, not standing you up, but then asking you to marry them, standing them up. And then, you know, sort of like just, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. But you know, so that, that, that was going on for about three months. I've seen women talk openly online about how addicted they get to this sort of behavior. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I, and, and not when there's even an end game, just, just by toxic men who throw the hot and cold game at them. And because c- this is why women like, a lot of them find average Joes, normal guys who are just decent blokes, yeah. boring. Yeah. Because when they've had head cases before, who you just don't know what the fuck's coming next, it's exciting. It is. And unfortunately, yeah. 
women like there's a reason why women like watching soap operas they, you know it's fucking interesting right and when their own life becomes one there's a period where they're like fuck me this is exciting yeah and it must have been oh yeah I mean yeah. it was but I mean it's uh, at that that stage it was it was just kind of it was getting irritating oh. right that the, the standing me up and you know that that was starting to wear very very thin mm. um and i i sort of i kind of went right i need to know what's going on here and i i did a bit of digging around and the thing was in in 2001 you didn't have google you didn't have the kind of resources you have now um uh so what i did is i actually looked up company house because i knew he ran a company uh and a company's house it had this woman's name and an address in Gullen um, as a company secretary for his company. And it was a, it was an address he had not mentioned to me. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll, Gullen is like 45 minutes drive from Edinburgh. I'll go and have a look. And How many months in was this roughly? About four months into okay. the relationship, about three months after he proposed. So. Um, and uh, yeah, and I sort of like, so I drove to this house and he was away in Manchester at the time. He just, it had been announced in the Times that he'd just been recruited as the, the head of IT for this company in Manchester. Um, so that was legit. Oh yeah, that was legit. Yeah, so he's doing pretty well. There's a whole other story about that, by the way. Okay, <laughs> okay, we'll get into that. But, um, yeah, so he, he, yeah, he was doing quite well. Um, so, it, and the company, what he said he did for a living at the time was that he would hack into people's IT systems to see whether or not they were hackable. So people would pay him to try and see whether or not they could, you know, so he could mm -hmm. hack into their systems, you know. So it was kind of like um, um, a forensic IT guy. So I went to Gullen and, you know, had a, looked up this house. And here is this huge house on the corner of a really beautiful, and Gullen is a pretty rich town. Um, you know, it's all golf clubs and, you know, stuff oh, like that. Um, and, um, and here was this enormous house with, you know, his car in the driveway and children's equipment at the garden. And, you know, sort of like on the roof is all these antenna and stuff like that. Um, and, and I was sort of going, he's bloody married, you know, excuse the language. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's married and he's got kids. And, but the, how could that be possible? Because he's, he can't have kids. He's infertile, you know. Um, and this was, this was a bugbear in his life. This was baggage that he took with him. You know, it was the fact that he'd always wanted to have kids, and, you know, that he'd never be, and he, but he'd known since he was 18 that he couldn't. Um, and, you know, but this, it, et cetera, is why it made it perfect that I already had a child. You know, all this guy, I mean, it had been, it not been nagged, but it had been talked about. We didn't even talk about adopting. That's that sort of like. So the fact that he might have kids was just totally alien at this stage. Anyway, I went home and I I I I, sh I could have knocked on the door, but I didn't. Right, I, I went home and I texted him. I just said, "We have to talk. This is not good news." Right, um, and so he he came back from Manchester. And and came to the house and and we sat down and we and he said, look, I've got something to tell you, uh, and uh, you know, please don't ask any questions until I finished. And I said, okay. And then he left the room, right? And I'm sitting on the couch going, what? And it's like, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, he's married with kids. He's been lying to me all this time. And but he he left the room and he he paced up and down in the the hallway outside the sitting room door, talking to someone on the phone for about forty five minutes. And I'm I'm sitting there going, what what answer could there be to this that is going to come out good, you know? Um and then he came back in and he sat down and he said, Right, I've been given permission to tell you. Um, so I work for the official department of central intelligence, more commonly known as the CIA. I was recruited from university. Uh I'm not a spy, I'm an IT person. I work in a I'm like the guy in the van. You know, he's the, the the one that does the support stuff, that he's a specialist in certain areas, um, that he's on secondment to the MOD from the CIA. That's why he's working in Britain. Um and and he talked about for about two hours telling me all the details of this thing. Whilst he's talking, my phone is updating with ODCI relay. You know one of those old blue Nokia phones. Mm -hmm. And it used to just have telephone numbers. You didn't get names on mm. it at the time and it was saying MOD relay on it 
I didn't even know it could do that at the time, right? And and ODCI really, um, and SIM update, and it was just doing beep 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 all the time. And I'm kind of keep looking at my phone, going, "What is what is going on here?" It's just like it was just the most bizarre conversation. Um, and then he shows me the the ODCI.net website, and you know shows me behind you know the logins for the the CIA, you know, you know all the the logos and everything on it, um, you know. And he said, but the 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 main thing he said was, "You don't have to believe anything I'm going." to say it's all going to be proved in time so just just hold off because you'll meet people you'll see things you'll hear things you know things will be proved you don't have to believe anything right now in regards to the house and the 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 kids toys outside and stuff so that was a safe house okay so it was it was a it was it was a team place and the best way to disguise it disguise it was to have children's toys i had actually when i was in the street i'd ask somebody who owned it and they said oh they don't know everyone keeps themselves to themselves around here and he said, did you not notice the antenna on the roof? And I said, yeah. He said, that's all communication stuff, um, you know, et cetera. So it's like, you know, and I'm going and going, okay, well, he most likely still is married with children, you know, but I will hold off and see if this evidence comes. So it wasn't like I went, oh, okay, I believe you. You know, it was, it was the suspension of disbelief as opposed to me buying into it. I think that the thing that we've glossed over in this conversation, because we can't reenact it, we can't sit and listen to them, but to, for someone to sit there and ha- like log into websites in front of you and spend two hours explaining everything, like, you know, when you've invested this time into this guy and you're in love with him mm. and you want to believe him, and that's the key here is the love bombing makes you want to believe him. Mm-hmm. That's this... The secret ingredient, all yeah. of this, right? It's the little- fire, the, you know, the passion that you have at this point, the memories and the, and, the, and the dreams that you want to have together. You want to believe him. Yeah. And he's actually coming up with some pretty, um, you know, as ex- as uh, there's a lot of men watching this right now that would sit there going, I wish my lies. Probably, probably taking notes. Yeah. Uh, I wish when I got caught, I'd have thought of this level of shit. But the, the, the point is, is he's obviously a very clever man in regards to technical stuff and was able to pile it on yeah. you and give you as much, and again, as much detail mm. so that it's as believable as humanly possible. Yeah. So are you still like sleeping with him and doing the usual stuff? Yeah. I mean, it was the usual stuff. Yeah. No. I, the, yeah. I was, I was still sleeping with him. Yeah. Still, I, I, things were things were sort of everything else was fine. It was mm. just this standing me up thing, um, and you know, for, I mean, I can't I can't remember what happened the days after that, but it was very much kind of like, okay, well, I'm waiting to see where where this evidence is coming, and the next time that he couldn't come to something, I got a phone call. So when, instead of standing me up, I got a phone call from, from a woman who said, no, just let you know, uh, well, Jordan's unable to come. Um, he said you would understand. So just, uh, he'll be in touch as soon as he can. So, and, and he'd said, you know, people will be able to call you now because you're now in the loop. Um, so people will be able to, cause you're my fiance and, you know, et cetera, people will be able to actually include you. Um, so they won't be able to tell you where I am, but they'll be able to say, you know, so you won't be left in the lurch. So, this, you know, this woman called me and I was like, oh, okay, can I ask any questions? No, but, you know, just, you know, they'll be in touch. Uh, and then he got back in touch. And so suddenly I wasn't being just dumped. I was I was actually being included. And then he, he started getting sort of money packet when he was paid in cash for things. He would actually have money packets which had MOD stamped on them. Um, you know, all sorts of other things happened, but there was the it was the people verifying Oh hearing a voice on the end of the phone yeah. is is rock solid to yeah. someone. You're yeah. like, all right, I'm getting a phone call from what sounds like a really professional woman here. Yeah. Um and you know, it just begs the question, who the hell was that? Do you know, I I I thought a long time about that afterwards. And you imagine the scenario as he goes up to somebody in the street and says I want to go and get my wife a birthday present, but I'm supposed to be home. Could you possibly phone her and just say that I've been delayed? Yeah. It could have been anyone in the street. Yeah. Or you didn't could pay someone to. or... It yeah. didn't, he wouldn't have to. Yeah. He wouldn't have to. He would just be you know, in a cafe or anything else. He'd be able to turn around to someone and say, listen, I just want to do something as a surprise to my wife. Could you possibly ring her and say, or I'm being called away and my battery's died. Could you phone her? Um, you know, etc. It really, it's it's actually that simple. There was one time that I was in a, um, a theatre and I was sitting there and he was he he was late coming. He said, "I'll see you at the theatre. I'll I'll be there. Just leave the ticket for me on the door." Uh, and then you know, sort of like I'm sit, sitting there waiting for him to come through the door. And somebody came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, "Just want to let you know that he's not coming." <laughs> 
you know so just uh he asked me to let you know and you know and I was just like oh my god I'm actually meeting someone in person this time you know and uh and I was kind of blown away by that and it, but looking back it's probably the theater manager he probably phoned and said could you go and tell my wife because <laughs> <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors it's all you know yeah, but, but it's it, all it feels be- very official because he's painted such an elaborate story yes. so because he's he, because he's painted that backstory then oh. all these things happening you know these people contacting you don't think you know oh that's some random stranger that he's asked to do that you know it, it's all fitting in with the narrative that he's painted um and it's like the the, the thing i think that's the main key about this as well is there was no end game visible it wasn't like he was asking me for money it wasn't like he was you know some uh, drug dealer or something you know he was clearly a you know sort of like a, he's a bit of a nerd you know it just it there wasn't it doesn't make any sense mm. what's he gaining from this you know that that having a relationship with me it, it doesn't seem like a a, a good con man's end game mm. does that make sense yeah because it's a long con yeah, yeah it, obviously you know um men have been known to use women for certain things sex mainly hmm. but like to go to these lengths for for what like exactly. yeah and I, I we'll get on to that i suppose but um you know so 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 you're still skeptical but nothing's being verified hmm. and sort of uh, what's the next turn in the story for you in terms of, I mean, there's more, is there more commitment coming? Well, yeah, I got pregnant. There you go. That, <laughs> that will happen. That was a surprise. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it will happen, in the, but it won't if your husband's infertile. Well, so that was the, the biggest, uh, yeah, that, that, that was that, a, the biggest red flag, I guess, immediately where you thought, this isn't right. I know this isn't right. Do you know, by that, by that stage, I was so ingrained in his story. I was so hooked into it that actually I sat down when I found out I was pregnant. I was absolutely stunned. Um, I genuinely looked through my diary to see whether or not I had been to any parties or been anywhere where somebody might have been able to have refeed me because I was so convinced that he couldn't possibly father a child. Wow. Genuinely, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's so hard to explain that. I, I When I contacted him to tell him, I was utterly convinced he was going to leave me because he, th- he will have thought I'd had an affair even though I knew I hadn't. And I was just like, I was so relieved that when I actually told him, he just, he just said, oh my God. You know. Was that in person? Yeah. So I so, told him, and he, he actually, all the blood drained from his face. He was like, he, he turned, you know, he sort of leaned backwards and he, he sort of went against the wall and he said, you know, I'd been told that, you know, it sounds over dramatic. It wasn't quite like that, but, um, you know, he said, I've been told it was like one in a million chance that it could happen, you know, and, you know, you're just amazing. You know, you've managed to conceive a child for me. You've done the one thing that nobody else could do, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And you felt fantastic. I I felt amazed because I I mean I did feel fantastic that he didn't think I had an affair. I was I was really proud of him that he had that much trust in me. Um it's like you look back at it now and just go, oh but um yeah, I mean his his wife and his nanny were both pregnant when he wrote to me saying that 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 he was infertile. Wow. You know, and it's like the This man the, even did the nanny. Oh, twice. No Two way. children with a nanny. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so how how long you'd been with him by the time you got pregnant? Uh, that was about six months. Okay. Um, Obviously, you're not you're not thinking that I need to be protecting myself here because the guys told me he's he's Jaffa. Yeah. He's seedless. <laughs> never, I've never heard anyone say that. It's a, it's a, it's a Newcastle saying that. So you're you're the Wonder Woman who's managed to give him give him yeah. a child finally. Yeah. And that's I guess a time for celebration, a yeah. time to, for you guys to feel like okay, this is something really special. We're getting closer, more invested. It's more real. His, par- his parents rang me to say how pleased they were to have their first grandchild you know that uh, you know they were really they were just over the moon um but, but, so had a, but he already had a, a child did they know about the other children or yeah no? they, they'd spent christmas with uh, the other wife and the five kids so um yeah oh, wow okay okay so i think what we'll do is we'll we'll go back to the other people that you find out about later yeah. for now we'll stick on your stick journey my, yeah because um, there's a baby on the way. You've already got one child. You're now having pregnant, another one. Yes. Um, so and- we were we were supposed to get married. So mm. um, and we were supposed to be getting married. Uh, I think it's, it's like July, August, or something like that. Um, and I was kind of like going because I, I had I was still slightly old fashioned. Going, you know, I, if we're going to have a baby, I want to want to. St- st- 
of course. tie the knot, you know, mm. sort of that. Um, and uh, so we'd sort of set everything out, send out the invitations, everything was sorted, wedding bread dress was bought, you know, et cetera, um, and then taken out because I was starting to expand. Uh. Um, and uh, so it's like, that. The, and, and then sort of like two or three weeks before the, the wedding, he said, I'm being called away. Um, and he, he said, I'm, I'm going to be a while, you know, so, so we have to put it on pause. So I had to write out to everybody and just say, weddings postponed and you know, et cetera. And again, it was utterly humiliating. Um, but because everyone, of course, thought he'd jilted me. Um, and I was going, no, but I couldn't explain to them what was going on because I was, you know, sworn to secrecy and you know, couldn't talk to anyone about what was happening. So I just had to say, no, no, it's all okay. Just he's, he's got work. So we've just got to do it another time. Um, so throughout that kind of next nine months, basically, uh, I expanded. He came back in December for a weekend. Um, and the whole time he was away, he was contacting me. It was he was in the Janine area of the Palestinian territories, um, which at the time, you know, he was he was telling me about what was going on there. I was he, we were talking on satellite phone. Um, the basically the um, the 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 city was surrounded and the the Israeli army were actually bulldozing the houses um, with people inside. So um, it, it was with, this is what he was telling me. So um, I'm I'm not sure how much of it's fact or whatever. But um, you were obviously really worried, though. I was watching it all on the news. I was watching it, l- l- expecting to see my partner there. Um, and uh, you know, he, he was he was stuck in basically a situation he couldn't get out of. He was dropped in there and he couldn't get out. So you know, he was there for for months on end. So I gave birth, um, and he was still saying, "I'm, I should be with. You. I'll be, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there." Um, but he just never turned up. And when he did finally arrive home, um, his daughter was now sort of two months old, um, and uh, he he arrived home, and his his feet were in a horrendous state. They were all cracked and black and blue and stuff. Um, and uh, he, he basically said he he hadn't been able to take his socks and shoes off for, for three months. Um, and when he came back, he actually had to have his socks pretty much surgically removed because he just he hadn't been able to take them off. So I mean, and I, and he was really thin, and he was really kind of grey looking. Jeez. And when, he's like a meth addict, now, this guy, isn't he? Yeah, he really like, takes this shit like to the next level. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. So he'd been like doing all of this to himself. Mm-hmm. Knowing when I get to see her, this story needs to line up. So I need physical um, issues gone wrong, wrong with me to make her see. Oh, he's not in a good way. Mm-hmm. It's been hard for him. This. Yeah. Whereas in reality, I'm assuming he's with this other family, just on a diet, and and wearing boots two sizes too small for him for three weeks. Yeah. So. And how many months in total had he been away by the time you'd seen him again? So he was away about nine months. So, because uh, I was about two or three months pregnant when he left, and, and and I saw him once when I was about six months pregnant for a weekend, and then he came back when she was about two months old. That must have been really so, hard for you going through a whole pregnancy. Like, let's put that to one side. What what you're being lied to? Just even doing that, being a woman who's pregnant on her own with a uh, two year old daughter, dude. I feel yeah. like that is hard to. It's go not easy, that. but it was like dating Superman. It was like complaining about Superman not coming back for dinner uh-huh. because. Is off saving the world. You felt so selfish complaining about it. That, that was not, no, but <laughs> not every woman's like this, you see. Yeah. So, like, there's a lot of good men out there yeah. who need time to go to work. Do, I, most of my mates are offshore uh-huh. and they still get shit off their woman all the time, right? So, like, you were very much putting him first. Yeah, constantly there to think that. But it wasn't. I mean, it's not just him though, because it's mm. like it, what he was telling me he was doing was something that's that's helping helping people. Yes, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, and you're seeing it on the news, so it's real. Yeah, and I'm seeing seeing dead children in the street. Yeah. I'm seeing people being, you know, people's lives and homes being literally torn out, mm. and and I'm sitting there going, well, I'm sitting here pregnant and alone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like how can I complain about that? You know, when there are people dying. <laughs> It just it that didn't it just felt wrong. It just felt so selfish. So I, you just swallow it. You just don't you, you don't go. No, I'm not gonna. And do you think it was to do with the pregnancy that you didn't want to have to deal with that? Or I don't know actually because it, it, it's it's very possible there were just other things going on for him at the time. Yeah, you and don't know. you know he was just he was just sort of kind of. I mean, I I think in in terms of as a psychopath. Uh, he wants to control people. He wants to, and actually having the girlfriends pregnant 
and sleep deprived or having already had his child, you're more attached to him. So now this is the father of your child. You've got to then interact with them regardless, even if you if even if you're not in a relationship with them anymore, you still have to interact with them and therefore you are still in part under their control. He's got you. He's got you. Once, once he's got you pregnant, got you. I've completed the game then. I've got I've imp- literally implanted my seed in you, so therefore you belong to me on some level. Yeah. Like not even belong. It's just a plaything. The, to a psychopath, the, the, it's not. It's not like attachment. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are some. I, I, I know where you're coming from because there are some guys who kind of feel like territorial. Yes. Yeah. But it's not like that. Mm. It's not with a, with a psychopath. It's not that that be more narcissistic. Yeah. Right? But with a psychopath, it's more like a Sims game. Wow. Right. So it's more like I'm making this character do this, and I'm making this character do that. You know. And if if that character dies, it's like oh. Okay. All right. Well, go on to this one. You know, it's it's like it doesn't matter at all. So it's not like a possession or anything. It's not you. You. It's more like an ant farm. That's know. such a great description because for for normal people, uh, I I would never think about using someone in such a way like yeah. that as as entertainment, so to speak. Yeah. Um. So th- yeah, that is is mind blowing. And when he comes back into your life. Uh, you, like you said, you're in a situation where you're sleep deprived. You've had to do all of this on your own, raising a child, having a child, and now he's finally there. Yeah. Did you feel like you became a unit again? Well, yeah, we did. I mean, when he first came back, well, came back, came back from Oxford, but uh, came back from Janine. Mm-hmm. He he wanted out of the CIA, so he now wanted to be a civilian and not be part of this. So um, we then went through the whole process of trying to get him work and he got work in a big IT company. He was earning a lot of money. He was earning about £10,000 a month, um, which is a lot of money to me. <laughs> it's a lot of money, um, for sure. and, especially uh, back then, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, and, and he was, he was, you know, suddenly you now we had the high life we had, you know, we were able to, uh, although I owned my own flat, it was a two bedroom flat. So we ended up renting a house so that we could have the rooms. That's when disaster struck so disaster struck in the form of when he was working for the big software company because he was no longer protected um as the intelligence services he ran across somebody this is the story told me he ran across somebody who he had previously um researched and uh turned as an asset um who was part of uh, kind of a, a, a unsavory group shall conspiracy we say. type thing um more like the people that kind of flew the planes in the twin towers kind of thing oh right um so and I, because he was no longer protected he was using his real name and his real passport and everything else this person now knew who he was and had looked up in his details on the the hr stuff and in this company and now knew where his wife and his kids lived and had said to him that they were going to extract revenge from him and they were either going to kidnap the kids and rip bits of them and sell them through the post to us or we had to come up with money to protect them. And you know, and he had no protection from anybody because he was no longer, because he was out. You know, so. I'm trying to, um, and I'm sure you might be able to help out with this, I'm trying to sort of reason, okay, he's making £10,000 a month here, mm-hmm. which is great money. Mm-hmm. He now comes to you with a story that, well, we need money to pay these people off. Yeah. I'm trying to understand where the real need for money was if he's making all this money and what 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 is the real purpose behind all There's of no it. real purpose behind it. Uh. The, the the thing that drives psychopaths is money, sex and power. It's actually the thing the real driver, the real engine of a psychopath is boredom. So nothing nothing engages them. So him going to work every day and having the love and support of a wife, seeing his children, yeah. which for a normal man would be I mean, 10 grand a, a month. Every, it's the dream, actually. Yeah. It's, it's actually the dream that every man wants, in yeah. my opinion. So for him, though, the, it's fuck boring. this. Yeah, it's I need boring. to stir some shit up. Yes. Yeah, that's wild, man. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's, like, and it's, also, it's also not about the money. Right. What it's about is about how much measure of control he has over another human yeah. being, because that is the real game. Yeah. You know, the, the money is just the measure of control. You know, when, when people don't have money, you'll use something else. Um, so he wants to judge the how, how, how much chaos can I inflict on this situation and her still be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm going to measure that in how much money she can find in this scenario. Yeah. Just for a, how, how much can I, what, what can I make her do? To keep her kids safe, what what will she do to keep her kids safe? Uh, How far will she go? 
and also uh, uh, not just for our kids, but for for him. Yeah, yeah, he's the one benefiting in this yeah. fake scenario. So, 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 how far did you go? I've got, I've got a great example when we're, we're talking about how psychopaths function. I'll look yeah. back to that in a second. But the the thing that still pisses me off, right, big time, and I know why it pisses me off, and it's because it's because of my reaction to it, not anything else. And it's a really simple thing, but it's a really, really good example about how psychopaths function, right? Is that he told me once, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back in Edinburgh and you know, can you come and pick me up? Uh, and I had, so Robin was about three years old and Ailey was just a baby in, in, in the car, you know, in a uh, car seat. Um, and so I said, yeah, sure. And I, I took, went, drove over to Edinburgh, George Street, sat in the thing, texted him and said, I'm, I'm here, come on, you know. And he said, oh, brilliant, I'm on my way down. And I sat there singing songs with my daughter. Luckily, Ailey was asleep, um, but singing songs with my three-year-old daughter. And 10 minutes go by and I text him again and going, where are you? You know, we're still waiting. And he goes, oh, sorry, I was caught on the stairs. Somebody just asked me to do something. Um, you know, I'll, I'll not be long. All right. So another 10 minutes goes by and I'm texting him again saying, where are you? You know, this is getting ridiculous. Um, and he's going, oh, sorry, the person asked me to do something. You know, it's not going to take me long, et cetera, et cetera. This went on for two hours. Wow. Two hours I sat there. After two hours, he stopped texting me back. So I sat there for a little while longer and then just went, home just drove off right what annoys me about it is a he wasn't in edinburgh he was in oxford at the time so he wasn't even there he just wanted to see how long he can make me wait just to see how long and in this right? case time is the measuring stick yes. not money but yeah yes. so it's like but what annoys me about it is i didn't give up he did he got bored of the game so i actually stayed so long that he kind of went, eh, hey, hey. you know, done with that. And just went off and had tea with his wife or whatever and left me still sitting there, still texting him. Do you, do, you know, do you know how you're beating yourself up about that? And that that's what this is. You're angry mm. at yourself because you feel like, oh, I've been a mug there. But like a good man yeah. would deserve that, you know. Do you know? Do you know what I'm mean? like? I don't. Yeah. I don't mean like because yeah. a good man wouldn't put you through that. But like when I hear stories of women like this, I always think to myself, like, yeah, but you see that love that you had, that dedication and yeah. devotion. When when women like that meet a good man, it's a match made in heaven yeah. because you're both giving, and it's a competition of who can give the most. Then yeah. not taking and giving. Why didn't to, I meet someone like that? <sighs> I mean, yeah, it is hard to meet good people. Like that's that's true. But like, unfortunately, I think that the great people often end up with the takers. Yeah. Like, well, that's that's that that's actually the, the, there's a uh, they target them. They see oh, yeah. them. Psychopaths particularly target empaths. One of the things I was uh, the, the my book I was researching I was really quite fascinated by is I know there's a spectrum of psychopathy. So about one percent of society are psychopaths, full blown out and out psychopaths. Up to fifteen percent of the society are on that spectrum. It's just a scary thought. That but, really makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like what I'd never realised before I started writing the book is actually there's another uh, the other end of the spectrum. You've got people that are so empathic they can't actually function, um, and you've got you know if up to fifteen percent of people are on that that upper spectrum. Of I've empathy. seen them as well. And it's so so I can't watch things like Jackass right without feeling physical pain. Yeah. When I watch it because it's like I, I empathise so much with people I actually feel that physical pain. Mm. There's actually there's there's two points in your brain can't do this with the headphones on, but there's two points in your brain that that's b b behind your ears and, and just on the top of your head, that if I snapped my finger and just went crack in front of you, your eyes would crinkle, you'd, you'd kind of mm -hmm. like wince backwards because it's like two hot needles going into your brain. Mm -hmm. You feel physical pain on somebody else's pain, right? And the more empathic you are, the more physical pain you actually feel. So I, if I see someone hurting, my, hurting, like a kid falling over and scraping their knee, my knee hurts. Mm. You know, sort of like, and I, I, I just can't watch those things with people. My kids can watch them and laugh their heads off. They think mm. it's brilliant, and I just kind of, I just wince. And it's yeah. like, so psychopaths don't have that at all. So they don't have any kind of response when somebody hurts themselves. They don't feel anything. They just kind of, you know, if they see a car crash, they'll look at it and go, "Ooh, how are people reacting?" So they can learn from it. And this is why often, you know, you hear of them as kids torturing animals, stuff like that. Yeah. Things that ordinary people who are just in the middle, not 
great people necessarily, but not horrible. Even they couldn't handle the thought of, you know, they, yeah, yeah they, and they are just so soulless and emotionless. It is bizarre. But I, I actually really like the point you made about the people who are too empathetic, almost like uh, having met some of them, those people who are too nice for their own good, too soft. Um, and it's having, cri- it's crippling. having someone like yeah. that with, Obviously, one of these psychos, it, it's like food, mm-hmm. you know, um, and unfortunately, it feels like that was a bit like what you became in that scenario. Um, so, so yeah, um, going going back, sorry, to, to, to this point yeah. where he's going, we need the money. Yeah. What are you going to do? What did you do? Everything. Everything I could. I sold my flat. I sold my life insurance. I sold my car. I sold my piano. I sold everything. Um, and it wasn't like it happened overnight. It was it was like a, a shark's feeding frenzy over about nine months. So, uh, I mean, for instance, initially it wasn't, it was like 10 grand. So, okay, how can I get 10 grand? Okay, well, you know, I borrowed it off my, my mum for that. And then, um, okay, so... When you say other, it was like 10 grand, do you mean he was putting different numbers at you going, right they, now we this, need this, this then we this, need yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's so it, start, it wasn't like they said, oh, we're going to need like this much money up front it was just like this this is what they're needing and they need more and they need more and they need more and they need more and it's it's i i went into complete panic mode um you know sort of the fight or flight thing i was in both fight and flight and i was just like the the only thing i could see at the time was my children were in danger um and so i borrowed as much money i could when i when i realized i couldn't borrow anymore i sold my flat paid off those debts then had more money in the bank and thought well at least i've got this money you know etc um and that went that just went, you know, bit by bit. And then to, to him, to him, mm. all told it was £198,000. Um, and it, eventually I, so I couldn't even pay the rent. I couldn't feed my kids. I, all the money he was earning, his £10,000 a month that he was still earning was going to this debt, to going to these people. So he wasn't bringing anything in, either though he was still earning, he wasn't bringing anything in. And, it, and were you still living in the rented? Yeah. Co- uh, so, I mean, my, my head, at the time, my head was sort of thinking, well, he's earning 10 grand a month. So once we get this sorted, you know, we're going to be back on our feet really quickly. You know, I was earning as well. It wasn't like I was sitting doing nothing. You know, I was I was working as a consultant at the time as well. So I had a fairly okay income as well. Um, so it wasn't like, it was just, or, you know, anyway, but, um, so, you know, my, in my head, it was like, if we can just get past this, if we can just ke- hold on, if we can mm-hmm. just stay alive, basically, until, you know, until this is done, um, until they, they stop. I don't know what I thought was going to stop them, but, you know, I think in my head, I knew it was going to be when I had nothing left. Um, yeah, but... It- <laughs> When you when you're operating out of love, which is what you were coming from, you're coming from a place of love. You don't want to quit, do you? Like because you've got babies to look after. Yeah. So the 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 option of quitting when you have children is is not an option, is it? It doesn't. It doesn't even. There was no way of quitting. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like if I said, "All right, well, I'm no longer in a relationship with him," that we wouldn't be in danger. Because as far as as far as I was concerned, he was he was the one that was keeping us safe. He was keeping them away from us. All right. And it's like, if I just said, all right, you bugger off, then we're just facing these people on our own. If that makes any sense. I mean, I I was so brainwashed Mm -hmm. that I just, the only person I thought I could trust was him. I couldn't tell anyone else what was going on in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, To everybody else, I had a smile on my face. Everything was good. You know, it's fine and everything else. Not a single other person knew. Nobody knew. And when you're transferring the money, Mm -hmm. is it, are you wiring it or is it cash? Cash. I mean, well, some of it was going into an account that he had that that I was, so, so some of it was paying into account. I mean, uh, towards the end, it was like fifty pounds here and there, you know, because it was like, what could I scrape together? It was no longer like ten thousand here and there. It was it was it was fifty pounds. Can you give me fifty pounds for petrol, and I can at least get to this place, um, you know, etc. I mean, it was literally squeezing that lemon dry, um, and I couldn't. I mean, I hadn't paid the rent in three months, and you know, sort of like the he he constantly said, "Oh, you know, I've paid it. I don't know why they're asking for it. I've paid it. I've paid it." You know, um, and I just said to them. Uh, it's not happening. Um, so, you know, with um, by this time, by the way, I was pregnant again. Um, oh. And so the whole way through my pregnancy, I was living in this absolutely horrendous stress state. Um, I mean, he got me a taser. So I was uh, going around the house every night. I would wake up hearing noises in the house. You know, he'd be away. He'd be away working with this 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 uh, big software company. And, you know, so I'd be on my own in the house with the kids. And 
every night in my head I would see these shadowy figures around every door and I would hear a noise and I would get up and I would search the house and and with this taser in my hand you know just utterly terrified of what you I had you in a, in a manic state almost. oh totally yeah, yeah. And it was utterly terrifying. I mean, it was horrendous. And at the same time, no money. So I would be looking down the backs of sofas and stuff like that to see if I could get enough money to get some milk so I could at least make the kids some porridge. And I I mean, sort of not my finest hour, but I would actually go around my mum's house or friends' houses when I knew they would be cooking the tea for their kids so that they would go, oh, yeah, we'll check some, you know. Yeah. You know, just to make sure the kids got a good meal. I mean, that- it was honestly, it was, it was a shark's feeding frenzy. It was just like... It was horrendous. It yeah, was just... I hate hearing that for you because, uh, you know, the fact that you're, ch- like, as a mother, the the thing that you're going to be rating yourself on is, am I doing a good job for my children first and foremost? That's the first thing you're judging yeah. your self-esteem on. And and you are trying, but you're so, um, as you say, brainwashed by this guy. And, and the question is, is, where is all this money going in reality? Like, do we have any idea or, okay, we'll get at that point. <laughs> Um, so you're you're pregnant again, and and what point at this in terms of timeline? How long have you known him now? By the time you're pregnant again, and uh, this is happening, by this stage, uh, I was sort of moving out the the house. I was saying um, four years that, since you met him now, roughly. So yeah, that was that was sort of four, four and a half. Well, I met him in two thousand, so okay. yeah, so four and a half years, I'd say. Um, and uh, we had um, I had to move out the house, so I had to pack the house up. Um, put everything in storage and I moved in with my mum and dad and sort of like that that was fun aged you know 39 saying to my mum and dad you know I have nowhere to go will you take me in um, can, and they, they can you did. just re-explain that sorry because that, that was a bit confusing for me I couldn't pay the rent so I couldn't pay the rent on the house I had nothing left I had no money I had to, I had my income I had my my money coming in from my income so, but I didn't it wasn't enough to pay the rent on my own um, and so I said to my parents you know can can you put us up you know until I find somewhere else and um, they say why because you've got a fella and he's earning good money by by that stage you know he'd actually sat them down and told them what he did for a living and so that, that you know things were a bit fraught at the moment but they were all going to be sorted so um so, so they're in on it as well yeah so yeah they were sucked in as well um my brother also who is very very county guy um nobody's fool um and initially was very distrustful of of will um, and uh, he got him very, very drunk, so w- deliberately. So one one night when we were over, uh, I think I was pregnant at the time, so I wasn't drinking, but he, I think between the two of them, they drank about six bottles of wine. Mm. I mean, they were absolutely stocious. Um, and because because Will then had, had, all, had now included my family in the, in the, the story, not it, not too much detail, but just there was more to this, and that he worked for intelligence services. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my brother got him, was quizzing him when drunk, and you know he was telling all sorts of CIA secrets about who killed JFK, and I mean honestly, everything, absolute character all mm-hmm. the way through to the point that he actually got alcohol poisoning and he spent the night on the bathroom floor. Um, and then I went home to the kids, and Jesus. You know, uh, but he was still sticking to his story. So after that, my brother believed him as well. So. Well, in, throughout this time, were there any periods where he slipped up a bit? Like, because because although these stories are far fetched, mm. they're consistent. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering were there any little mistakes that you look back on? You went, ah, you fucked up there, and I should have seen it. Uh, yeah. I hate the word should, but yes. Uh, um, or could, sorry. Sh- should is a shaming word. Yeah, you know, so. fair play. Um, but yeah, he, the, there were certainly times I could have seen it. And um, for instance, there was one point when he turned around and he said, uh, we were having a family event and, and and he was there and he came up to me and he said, um, I'm just I'm a bit uncomfortable. You, your sister just made a pass at me, right? And I just killed myself laughing. I just absolutely decked myself and went, no, she didn't. Because um, I know my sister well enough to know that there's no way yeah. she would ever do that, right? And it's that that's the right kind of relationship we have. Mm. And he just kind of went, oh, oh, right, I must have got it wrong. And I now know what he was doing was trying to drive a wedge between me and my family, but that's something he never managed to do. <sighs> Because he so, wanted you isolated. Yes. So he had to, He that's why he had to include my family because he couldn't isolate me from them. So he did initially. So in the first stages of it, it was just me and him. But then, you know, so by this stage when I was moving in with my family, you know, back in with my parents, he had to start making sure because they were getting, you know, what the heck's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, 
as I'd managed to hide everything until then. But, you know, at that, that stage, he, he had to actually include them. But, yeah, so, I mean, that, that was one stage. There was also, um, he told us that he'd, been, he'd lived in Japan for a couple of years and that he spoke fluent Japanese. Now, this was before he found out that my sister is married to a Japanese man. <laughs> And, I, and lives in Japan. She's actually that. she's an international sculptor, uh, wow. and uh, so she she you know every time she was coming home and and stuff, he he would vanish for work, and uh, and so she'd never met him. And she's a very she's a very strong skeptic about anything, you know. Uh, so uh, she she was really wanting to meet him, and it was absolutely determined when she did, she was going to see if he did speak Japanese, you know. Um, so finally, I don't know why. I think it, in my head, I knew he was avoiding her so I I hadn't told him that she was home uh, and we went round for lunch with my parents and they were all there and, and my sister was there and uh, and she asked him something in Japanese we're all sitting around the table you know sort of like Ailey his his first daughter uh, is sitting in a high chair just opposite him and uh, and she she asked him something very simple like what was the weather like in Japan when you were there in Japanese right but it was something he would he wouldn't be able to bluff his way out of. And uh, she she we had a conversation about it, me and my sister afterwards, because she left that day thinking that there wasn't anything wrong, right? But he never answered the question. All right. And we realized that was the time that Ailey's high chair fell over. Oh my God. He kicked his own baby daughter's high chair over to avoid answering the question. So by the time every, all the chaos has stopped and everything else, she knows she's asked her question, but she never got an answer, but she doesn't even think about it because something more dramatic happened. Yeah. Opportunistic to the fullest extent. No matter what happens, he'll do anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you've got to remember, he doesn't care about his children any more than he cares about the women. They're they're just pawns. They're just playthings. They're just S- Sims was a really good description yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So the second baby is now. So yeah. So Zach, my second second my my boy, my son was mm. born. I uh, can't remember the word for it. There uh, was born on the first of April two thousand and five, and just I mean. I'd moved in with parents just at that time, basically. Mm-hmm. So we were living, I mean, my parents, brilliant. I mean, they had, they had a decent sized house, so they had two spare rooms. So me and my son were in one room and the daughters, my two daughters were in the other room. Um, and, and we lived there for about three or four months. Were you still sending him money throughout that period? I was absolutely brassic by that stage. I had nothing left. All right. So you were saying we've got nothing, yeah. just. He, he did ask some money and he said, you know, we need, we need this. Was, uh, we have to have this. And this is the reason why. And he gave me much more detail about the, the dangers and everything else. And I, I literally just wrote back to him. I mean, still got the email, wrote back to him going, bring it on. I have nothing. I can't do it. And he said, can you borrow money off your family? And I was like, no, because I'd already, I'd already kind of like, I wasn't going to, I knew I'd lost everything in that stage and I wasn't going to do the same to my family. I wasn't, you know, it's like, I, it was actually that kind of, that moment of, oh, right, you know, if they're coming, they're coming. You know, there's no more I can do, you know, and I'm not going to, I was, I would just, I had enough empathy from my, my family not to drag them down with me. But he wanted that. Oh yeah. No. Wow. There's just relentlessness here, isn't there? There's just nothing, there's nothing he won't do. And, uh, and, and so, so the game is sort of over at this point, yeah. I'm assuming. Did he accept I, that or not? No, I think, well, yes and no. I mean, as in the, it, it this money, the money yeah. game, had, the money the, game, the money game had yeah. ended. So that you said he changed to a different game. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, I mean, at that time I was kind of, um, I, I was sort of kind of, I think my logical, rational brain was kind of going, there is no reason, now there's no money left, there's no reason for them to actually kidnap the kids, there's no reason for them to come and hurt me or the kids, but so they're probably going to leave us alone now, because as long as they know there is nothing, you know, etc. cetera, the, 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 I just, I thought I figured that was, it was at least the game, that game was over, their game, the, mm-hmm. the unsavory's game was over. Um, and, uh, so yeah, and he was like, okay, and and it just I'll deal with it. And so he kind of disappeared for a while, and I didn't know what was going on. But I had a baby son to deal with, and you know, etc. So I was just I just tried to 
put one foot in front of the other. You know that pregnancy? Mm. Was he present for much of that or no? Yeah, he was He was back and forth. Uh-huh. He was back and forth all the time. I mean, he didn't spend like weeks with us. He would spend a few days with us and a few days away and then she'd buy, you know, et cetera. So um, it was always very sporadic, you know, when we'd see him. Mm. Um, but I mean, he said he was like being, you know, he was, he was basically sort of like jumping all over the place trying to, he lost the job with the... Um, the software company. Um, he ended up getting a job at the um, Deputy Prime Minister's office, uh, Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott. Wow. Um, and he was working there. And this is true. This is true, yeah. I <laughs> mean, I, I went into his offices. I, I went mm. past security. They waved at him. You know, we went to saw his office and, you know, apparently so did a few others. But, um, you know, it's, it is, so, so yeah, he, he did actually work his, work in the office. But it, it was it was a little bit more evidence that he got a new contract. He was, you know, it, as intelligence service, Services, but within this office, you know, uh, he wasn't. He was just an IT guy. But and then I got um, uh, a phone call from him saying that he'd been arrested, um, and it, he 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 was driving a Mercedes car, which I I was paying for. It was coming out of um, uh, out of the business account, right? Mm-hmm. So which we set we set up a business guy, um, and so it was coming out of that account, which of course the only money going into it was my my money. So he was actually arrested at the car dealership getting the car repaired um, and turns out that he was the reason he was arrested is because one of his fiancés he'd used her credit card to pay for the car to get repaired um, without her permission so she'd set up a police sting and uh, he was arrested at the car um, and they searched the car and they said um, they found papers pertaining to his other wife in the car and then they looked at the car ownership and they said, hang on a minute, who's this? And they rang me and said, where's your car? And I said, it's my, my husband's driving it. And I, and I said, oh, thank you very much. And that was it. And then I got a phone call from Will saying, angry. The first time ever I've ever heard him angry saying, what have you done? And I was like, they asked where the car was. They told them, you know, no, no, you don't know what you've done. You've destroyed everything, you know. And uh, yeah, so it turned out, of course, because they had the papers with his other wife in the car, they charged him in bigamy. Um, no. Because it's like I said, my husband's driving it. So they knew that, that he so, was married to two women. So he that. fucked up by using the credit card of the other woman. Yeah, not not his other wife, one of his fiancés. So in 2005, he, had, he didn't just have two wives. He had five fiancés as well. So, uh, and, uh, so yeah, so the basic, this police sting, they found the taser in the car as well. Cause when I went, moved into my parents' house, I knew a taser was illegal. Um, and, uh, but I did actually report to the police and said, I had this taser, you know, sort of like, I need to hold my hands up to this. And the police, police that I talked to said, did, did you buy it? And he said, no, he did. And did you bring it? No, he brought it in the house. And what did you do with, you know, sort of like, did you take it out of the house? And I said, no, when we moved out, I, he took it away with him. I said, it was never yours. Um, so it's, uh, I was, but I, I was, I was glad that I did hold my hands up to that because it's like, I, I, I thought that that was probably a criminal act, but mm. it, it wasn't mine. So, but, so he, he was charged with bigamy. So bigamy, uh-huh. firearms, cause he had the taser in the car. Um, because I'd made him take it away with him when, when I moved into my parents. He was charged with, um, the fraud of his fiance, about 5,000 pounds and the one of the fiancés. And then he was also charged with not registering his address under the Sex Offenders Act because he also turns out to be a convicted paedophile. Whoa. <sighs> I tell you what, I've done a lot of interviews, love. It's one of the most shocking. That is, that it, is shocking. It that. is, it just, it's quite an extraordinary story, isn't it? It's just like, I mean, the, 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 Pedophile side of things. One of the, the there's, do you know that the, there's a test called the Psychopath Checklist Revised, the PCLR, right. uh, devised by Dr. Robert Hare, um, who is the leading expert, world leading expert on psychopathy, and it's a twenty question checklist, mm-hmm. and it's like the first, and it's a statement, and you you. It's done by a professional in a criminal facility, right? So, um, but the, the statement, for instance, the first one is grandiose sense of self worth. And it's like, is that zero? Does that person have zero? Or is it one? Or is it two? So are they definitely a bit of it? Or are they nothing? Right. And one of, one of the criteria, so it's juvenile delinquency, you know, grandiose sense of self worth, um, you know, many, many marital relationships, uh, you know, et cetera. And it goes through that. And one of the things is criminal versatility. And it's like a lot of criminals will con- will, will will be a thief, you know, or be a rapist, or will be a murderer. Um, psychopaths will do 
everything. Everything. They will do different things all over the place. Um, and I think with the particular case, um, it was, and I have to be very careful to make sure we don't identify the victim in this case, particularly. Um, there was one victim specifically. One, one specifically, yes. Mm. And it was the child of one of his um, partners. Um, and she was between the age of nine and 13. So it was uh, convictions against a girl under the age of 13. You said when, it, when you said it was the child of a partner without going into specifics, not, wasn't, one, not one of his, wasn't his child. No, okay. Step, so a okay. stepchild. Or something. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, we're not a stepchild, but a, a child of one of his partners. So, um, but yeah, so it's, and I think personally that in his mind, Remember, no guilt, no remorse, no you know empathy, etc. For anybody, I think the mother and daughter were close, and I think that he, in his mind, was by having an affair with the daughter, he was alienating the mother from the daughter. Like it? what he tried to do to you with your sister, right? It's the divide and conquer. Yeah, uh, but it's like because because he doesn't have that kind of moral compass that tells him. I mean, he knows it's wrong. But I think it was just a matter of, you know... Doesn't care. Doesn't care, so... And going back um, to the, the bigger me, uh, mm. charge, at that point, did it all come crumbling down in the sense of all of you got notified what had been going on? Or was that left for you guys to connect the dots yourselves? No, actually, it, it's it's strange, isn't it? But the police actually did say to him he had to tell me what was going on because otherwise they would. Um, because he told me at the time, he said, you know, sort of the bigamy, well, the other wife wasn't another wife, she was an asset. Um, and didn't I remember I'd spoken to her? And I I kind of like vaguely remembered speaking to her uh, at one point. And the, the, as a whole other level of things there is that actually, there, there were times when he would come home and we would have, you know, we would have um, a Prosecco and pizza or whatever. And, you know, so like we'd have a few glasses or whatever. And I, I don't usually get so drunk because I don't remember things. Uh, and I thought it was just because when I was with my husband, I, I was relaxed and I would wake up in the morning and I wouldn't remember things. All right. And sometimes he would tell me things that happened and I'd, I'd kind of just uh, take it on board that that's, that has happened. That's what happened. So he had told me that I'd spoken to this woman before uh, and I hadn't. Just I, he, yeah. It's just a kind of a setup thing. He's really so, thinking ahead, then. So yeah, so I, I believed I had spoken to this woman that she had told me that she was an asset, um, and so the bigamy thing wasn't huge to me because it's like I, I knew that that was somebody who he had used to be involved with um, professionally, right? Um, to allow him to come and stay in the country, um, and then there was the you know, so like, so he was he was breaking down the the, the criminal sheet and of saying that there's this, and there's this, but I'm sitting there going, all right, there's this sexual assault charge here that I need to know about. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. Can can I just backtrack just so that people understand? Are you now? In uh, a police situation with him, or are you at home with him? With no, no, I was at home. So, uh, so I, I got that call from the police first of all. Then I got a call from him, and then things went quiet. He disappeared for weeks, and then suddenly he got back in touch and says, "I need to tell you what I've been charged with because if I don't, then the police are going to call you." In fact, he actually said, "The police are going to call you, but I want to tell you first. Um, and so the good guy again. Yeah. So, but what he did is he broke down all the, the charges. So the bigamy was his asset. That's fine. The fiance thing, he's, he said, you know, that's just a misunderstanding. Um, the, so the, the, the fraud was just a misunderstanding. He didn't say it was fiance. Um, that the taser, well, I knew what the taser was, but then this, this, um, the, the sex offenders register um, was the the sticking point that he had to, to explain to me about, and what he said is that the person involved, the the girl involved in this in that case, actually signed a piece of paper saying that he had um, molested her, so that he could go into a sex offenders prison and gather some information from a particularly nasty group, so that they could bring down the paedophile ring, right. And here's me, after all this time, I've lost everything. I've had two children with this man and I kind of go, it's either or now. It's like jumping the Grand Canyon in, in two bands. You can't do it. You have to be on this side or that side. That's it. And it's like my brain could not comprehend that this man could be a paedophile. Could not comprehend it. Just could not compute. Um, but at the same time, having been a victim of childhood sexual abuse myself. Even worse. I'm just sitting there going... 
absolutely stunned by this. And and he said, you know, the the just hold off. Don't tell anything to the police about it, but just you know, hold off. We'll talk afterwards. And I'm gonna get you to talk to the victim in this case so she can verify to you it never happened. So I'm kind of going, right, I put this speak to the police. Always does this, doesn't he? Don't make a decision now. Hold Give that. me time. Just wait. Yeah. yeah. And um so I talked to the police, police told me, you know, what you know, what was going on? Did you was I aware of this? And I was going, No, he just told me I'm in shock, which was true. Anyway, so I had to go and see the social work department because, you know, they they have to verify that if he's, you know, if he's gonna come back into the house, then they have to take my children away. And so I'm, I'm sort of now dealing with social work. I'm dealing with police. I'm dealing with him. I still believe because I can't get my head around the fact that I could possibly have been living and sleeping with a pedophile after all my history and everything else as well. And, um, so I kind of go, okay, right. I, I'm, and he, he sets it up. I mean, talking to the actual victim in the case of his and the real one and it was the real one and um she she spoke to me and said no it never happened i signed something to say you know he is working for the intelligence services i've been on all these bases and and things like that you know i've known him most of my life um you know sort of like he's a he's a good guy um etc etc and she by this time was um 18 or something so um can i can i ask Hmm. Was she really deeply in love with him, and he'd put her up to the same thing to lie to you? Yeah. Because I've yeah. I've done a little bit of research into um, sex traffickers. Mm-hmm. Ironically, there's a very famous one on YouTube currently who has specifically said in his website, "I will retain them for decades." after I've got them in love with me and they will say anything. And I've seen girls online who've been in video smacked around and they will say in the, in, you know, publicly, it was just a game. I was just doing it because it was part of a game we used to play, but you're saying how much pain she's in, in the video. So you can, you can see it, but to her, she's still in that, um, warped frame of mind that she is under his umbrella. Right. So, so when you're saying this, I'm definitely getting some flashbacks to that sort of behavior. Um, and yeah, that is that and for you it was there a point where almost like sunken cost fallacy like i've invested so much into you mm. that i it can't not be true because that would destroy me and it, it has to be true it just everything i've done has been what i've been doing has been real yeah i've given you 200 plus thousand pounds i've had children to you i've married you i've put mm. invested everything into you so for it not to be real would just crumble everything so i i i can't not believe you now yeah for my own mental sanity i, I have to be- it's, it's like that glam- gambler finding that one last pound coin you have to gamble it because you've already lost everything yes i feel you you know and it's it's just that kind of and by now and now you know that but at that point it got you know shit got real you know, because mm. now we're talking about sexual violence against someone, you know. Mm. And yeah, it was just, it was all or nothing. At that was she thing. believable, the girl on the phone? She was. I mean, initially what she did was she just said, you know, I'm going to send you a statement just so you know and you understand the whole situation. So I got the statement, I read the statement, it just, it verified everything that he said, mm-hmm. right, in different language than he normally uses. And but of wow, course, he'd written even the that, even that length, yeah. yeah. Because I did actually meet meet with her afterwards, okay. and you know, sort of like with during the court case, I met with her, and and she said, you know, that she 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 had been coerced into doing certain things, um, but she had actually never sent me a statement. She, people she think just, coercion isn't a real thing out there, you know. When uh, when people get you know, this comes out, oh, what's coercion? Coercion, you're brainwashed, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, um, so the next stage of this was on the 5th of April, 2006. So that kind of all happened around January, February. So you took her word for it and you sort of were like, okay. Yeah. Um, I also, I also at the same time was not going to risk my children being taken away. So I had said, you know, I said to him, we can't continue. We cannot continue as a couple because even if you are a hero and you've never done any of this stuff and you, you've you caught paedophile rings and, you know, et cetera, even if you are that hero, if the socialist workers believe that you are a paedophile, they will take my children away. So you can't come 
home. You can't be here. It's good that that was there for you. Like, yeah. you know how there's so much logic defy, um, uh, defying things that you did. Mm. You, you got through the love and the brainwashing that you had. You still had that. I'm not going to fuck my family over and I'm not going to give my kids up no, no matter what you do. No. So that was still there. Yeah. yeah. I would I would cut my own heart out yeah. and break it or anything else yeah. to, to look after my children. But um, And then on the 5th of April 2006, I got a phone call. And I got a phone call from a woman and she, but this, he was actually going to court that day. So he was going to court that day and he was going to be charged, um, sort of with a, and, and plead guilty or not to, to all these different crimes. Um, and he'd said, you know, my, my female lawyer will call you, um, and let you know what happens. So I got this phone call and so I thought it was the lawyer and she just said, are you Mary Turner Thompson? And I said, yes. And she said, are you also Mrs. Jordan? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm the other Mrs. Jordan. And then she said, have you been told I'm an agent? And I said, yes. And she said, I've been told you're an agent. No. And that eight words, those eight words shattered the matrix. You know, I actually, I'm, I've gone cold my whole body has gone cold, just even saying them out loud again. I just the all the walls around me crumbled and I saw the truth for what it was. And it's like, there were no shadowy people. There were no, it was, it was all mm. him, everything. And it's like, and we talked on the phone for about two hours and then she said, I'm coming up. And she jumped in the car and she came straight up to Edinburgh and we sat and we talked for 12 hours. We actually, we actually went, I didn't want her in the flat to start with. So I, I, I got a friend um, and she came and sort of looked after the kids and mm. she, me and the, the other Mrs. Jordan went up to a cafe. Did and you have we, children with her as well? No, she 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 had five children with him, but she she left them behind. So oh, sorry, um, what I meant was she had children to him. Yes, yeah, five, five. Yes. Okay. Um. So and so we went to this cafe, and as we walked into the cafe, you know, sort of like we we're kind of both in shock. Um. And the the guy at the the counter said, "You know, can I help you?" And I said, "I don't know. We've just both found out we're married to the same man." And he said, "Um." I meant something to drink. Uh, and, I, and I just turned around and said, oh, all right, two cups of tea. And he said, do you want to share a pot? <laughs> bloody hell. Like, How did she get your phone number to ring you? How, what, what, what happened in her life to know? She, apparently she'd had it for a while. Um, uh, she, she'd had it in a notebook somewhere for a while. She'd been told and it was an emergency number that she was never to call. Um, but because he was at court that day, something triggered in her she just decided to phone it so what was he caught for this 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 initial thing that the, the Big, bigamy fraud firearms okay. and not registering his dress so okay um, and had something happened to tell like had he gone down or no he it, actually the court date was delayed so he he hadn't even gone into court they, mm. they they just they kept postponing it uh, i mean that was april 2006 he actually went to court in november 2006 oh. so because they kept bumping it up to the crown court because it, it was it was initially just a, a lower court and and then it went up to Crown Court, so it just it just kept getting delayed. Always happens with them. I don't know why. So, I don't know if it's normal because I've, you know, I've not been involved in many other criminal cases. You know. Well, yeah, um, thankfully, and this one's one to end all, I guess. And you were sitting there with this other woman who is has a family to this man. Mm -hmm. You have a family to this man. What was that conversation like? Would you? Did you? Was there animosity there, or was was there was there like friendship there immediately? There or? was. I mean, certainly not my part. Uh, she, she was sort of treating me a little bit about the, like the mistress. Um, she felt like the main one. Yeah. yeah. She, I mean, she'd been married him 10 years younger than me. So uh. technically she was the main one. Um, my marriage was basically non-existent. So, um, yes, yeah, so mine wasn't legal in the first place. How, so, how come? Because he was already married. You can't marry someone when you're already married. So bigamy is, you know, it's illegal, but it's also, it meant my marriage wasn't legalized in the first place. But to you, it was the whole time, and yeah. you'd you'd signed everything. You'd oh yeah, done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, but yeah, but um, so I mean, she was actually correct in the sense that I was technically I wasn't, you know. But I didn't. She also knew that I hadn't known any of this. So mm. you know, she she was kind of like, uh, yeah. So so she went around kind of looking at things and going, that's that's his, and I was going, no, that's mine. And she was going, oh right, you know, he's got something like that done in our house too, you know. So she went around looking at things and. And stuff, and we actually we sat down and we uh, she 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 rang his parents and spoke to them, um, and you know I recognised the voices that of people I used to speak to, so you know it was they they were complicit in it all. Um, his parents were working on behalf of him to yeah. keep the secret. Yeah, 
Oh, and not just not just about her five children and my two children, but also the nanny's two children. But the parents were also informed by various other people, um, which we'll get to as well. But um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, it sounds like that's the ending of the story. It's really not. That's just kind of like, we're getting to the, you know, sort of, oh. you know, it just goes downhill from here. <laughs> so, so, so this woman is, is quite, emo- naturally, she's, she's fucked up about this because she's like, you know, I thought I was the one and only, and now here you no, are. She, she, she knew he had affairs. Oh, so okay. she knew because she, she actually, the nanny had a baby by him, and she said, "Well, that's my children's sibling, so you can come live with us." Uh, nanny could carry on being the nanny, and the child would be. And then she got pregnant again by him. Wow! So she, she let the nanny so, stay after he got her up the duff. Yeah, well, she. I think she. I, I don't know. I mean, if I'm being generous, you know, it, it's it's you know, she was trying to think about the children growing up in isolation without their siblings, you know, sort of like, so this was a half sibling to her own children, you know, the first child. And it's like, Oh no, I, you know, you kind of fair play, but uh, not many women would be like, and she can keep cleaning for us. Cause she's been cleaning quite enough. Thank you very much. Um, but no, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a really complicated situation, but she did know about other affairs okay. because she knew about the, there was a lady in Japan, um, for instance, who actually we, we knew of her, but she's only, recently got in touch with us. Um, wow, so Japan so, was actually true. Yeah, but, but he was only there for a few weeks. He that's a, there, that's yeah. enough for this geezer, isn't it? Yeah, he just has a little taste of things you know, and stuff like that. And then, so yeah, he had had an affair with a girl in Japan. Um, there was another, you know, there's various things. Out, out, you know, so over the over the next few months, um, I, I kind of, I decided to go public. I decided that a... I, I, this is going to be a very long conversation, but um, I'm here for it. <laughs> I right. I I don't I don't have any issue talking about this, but I know it's a trigger for some people, so I want to warn people that I'm going to be talking about something. Uh, I appreciate right. that. Um, I I was sexually abused when I was a child. Right now, I was groomed by a friend of the family. It wasn't my it wasn't anyone in my family, but a friend of the family groomed me, played a game with me, made me feel like I was um, the the sort of the hide and seek and find me first kind of thing. So you know, the youngest of four children getting the attention of an adult. I was groomed. I participated in his game. I was sexually abused over about six months. Right, that finished when I was about six years old. Right. I tortured myself from the age of six to the age of 26. Right. The damage done to me finished when I was six, but I, from six to 26, I self harmed. I thought I was a piece of shit because I had participated in his game and therefore I was as bad as a pedophile because I didn't say no. Uh Right. So because I had enjoyed that game, that made me an awful person. At the age of 26, I suddenly realized that. What had done to me stopped when I was six, but everything else I'd done to myself. So with that realization, I went, I am never doing that to myself again. I'm never going to punish myself from having been a victim of a crime. All right. So when this happened, I went, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. I got all that life experience of knowing this was not my fault. I might have been naive, you know, sort of like you, you were saying like, you know, you, you, this could happen to anyone. This would never happen to me again because I now know everything that there is to know about psychopaths and how they function. Mm -hmm. So I would never get caught again. And that's why I try and educate people because hopefully it will stop them from being caught. You know, so if I knew now what I knew, if I knew then what I knew now, it would never have happened. Of course. But then I'd never have my wonderful children. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I so you gain strength from something that's yeah. which is horrific, like the worst thing anyone can go through, and you pulled from that, and now it was okay. Now I'm going to deal with you differently. Yeah, yeah, I like so that. It's, instead of, and it's a very similar thing mm. being groomed by a psychopath into a relationship. It's the same, with an adult. isn't it? It's exactly yeah. the same. So I, I kind of like came out of that literally that conversation with the other wife, and I texted him in the morning and just said, "Done." You know, she she said, "Don't don't let him know that he that you know, and we've met because I want to get the kids away from him." Uh, and uh, yeah. so I I kind of said, "Yeah, okay, fine." Um, so I didn't say, you know, I've just 
we've talked, etc. What I said is just, I'm done. That's it. You know, we're over. Uh, I thought dumping him a text was appropriate. Um, yeah. Not usually, but, you know, in this case, I thought it was Oh, no, he's not worth anything, right? No. So, How did you react? Um, oh, first of all, it was um, anger and then pleading and then, you know, sort of like, can I call you? And then tried to call me and I wouldn't reply. And, you know, sort of like, why are you doing this? And it went back and forth like that. Within the time it took her to get down there, um, was know. it hard to keep strong? Because no. it, it, I'm just I'm just want to put yeah. the scenario there because I would assume like you've wanted a certain level of attention and craving from him. Now all of a sudden you're showing strength out of nowhere, yeah. and he is trying to. Do you know what I mean? So that twenty years, yeah, that twenty years from six to twenty six mm. of of resilience and never going there again. Mm. That literally from from when I spoke to her, it was done. There was no going back. It wasn't like I was sitting there going, oh, but I love him or anything else. It was broken. There was I had jumped that Grand Canyon and there was no going back. It, so it wasn't any kind of like, you know, knowing the truth and knowing that, that everything that happened had been him doing it to me. You know, every single thing he'd done, the very moment he'd contacted me that email he crafted that he sent to me on that online dating thing said that he was infertile as a child from bad bad mums he had lied to me from the very very first words he'd sent me uh, his wife and his nanny were both in the house and both pregnant when he wrote that email to me so it wasn't like he was mistaken or anything mm -hmm. he had deliberately set me up from the very very beginning mm. so there wasn't anything that kind of went in my head Oh, but mm. maybe. Actually, my sister once said to me, she'll hate me for the saying this, but my sister once said to me, you know, sort of like after the whole thing, she said, to, but don't you think you might ever take him back? And I was just going, not in your life. Never. Not happening. No. And it's just it's because she is a romantic. And but it's also very hard. Like I've, you know, we've all seen those toxic relationships where one of them is a real, like especially one of them in particular is the really bad one. And you're like, but she always tell he always takes her back or what you know what I mean? And you kind of I can understand the questioning, but that's thank, addiction. Thank that's God you had this uh, yeah, addiction. And that's kind of what I was referring to with um the women who get obsessed by these toxic men a lot of the time because it's that hot and cold thing. You get addicted to the endorphins going not knowing what the fuck's coming next. But it's so good that you did have that strength. Um so so now the the word is out. Yeah. And 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 it's it's gaining momentum, and you're, um, but he 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 he's on the way back, and he doesn't know that she knows as well. So how does that unfold? Well, as soon as she arrived back, you know, she told him. So um, so then suddenly it's all I now understand. How could you do that? You know that you know this is a situation. You know, there's more to this. You know, there's more to this than meets the eye. <laughs> you know, sort of like you don't understand. She's all about money. There's this, that, and the other. I mean, it's all all just layer upon layer of other bullshit. I mean, it was just like, it just wasn't happening. It was just like, mm -hmm. and I just constantly, and for a while I was really nervous that he would just pitch up on the doorstep because I was worried because you know, that eye contact as that, you know, and I was worried that he might be able to suck me back in that way. But did you ever and fear him I, physically as in he may do no, something to hurt no, you? No, not really. Um, no, I'd lived in fear of other people, not, not him, mm -hmm. you know, but um, the, the idea that he might turn up on the doorstep made me very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that all his texts were all about, let me come and see you. Let me do this. Let me come, you know, I want to come and talk to you. You know, we need to talk face to face, etc. And I realized that he was constantly trying to say, and I realized that actually what's happening is if I said yes, if I said yes to seeing him face to face, then he was already halfway there because there's always, there's something that I will accept that he will say that will solve the situation. And it's like, so that's the I, equation in his head. Yeah. And he's been using that it, same equation over and over yeah, again. But the psychology of it really works mm. because it's like, if you say, you know, if he turns up on the door, I can slam it in his face. If he says, will you agree to meet me? And I agree then I'm already saying there's something that he can say hope. that I will listen to. So I just kept saying, no, no, mm -hmm. not going to meet you, not going to meet you. And it's like, you know, it just, it, he carried on from April to September. Um, my mother died in that period. So my mother became, was terminally ill. Um, just after I found out about him, my mother then was diagnosed terminally ill. She actually died on the 15th of August. So the whole process as well of that going on. What a life you were having. And it was, it was, it was an interesting year. Um, no, it really must have been hell, man. I feel for you. Yeah. Seriously. Um, but, uh, 
Um, and then, you know, sort of like all the way through that. And he was like, can I come and comfort you with your mother dying? I mean, everything. He was even oh, using that. Even you know? using that. And so I need to see the kids all the time and stuff like that. And I was just like, no, no, just kept saying no. And then, you know, he got out in bail for, for what he'd done. And I actually sort of like, I suddenly had this kind of brainwave. And I as well was talking to the police um, and, and giving them um explanations of what was going on and, and, and stuff like that. And I eventually turned around to the police at one point and said, do you know where he is? And they said, we can't tell you where he is. And I said, no, I don't want to know where he is. I want to know if you know where he is. And they said, well, you know, so we, we don't need to know where he is. He's out and bailed as long as he turns up to court. And I said, yes, you do. He is a convicted sex offender. He has to register his address under the Sex Offenders Act. Do you know where he is? And they went, good point. How the hell are, they, are you telling them? Like, <laughs> hey, so that's they, a good, hey, I'll tell you she's on to something, yeah. Maybe you should check that up. So they went They went to the hostel that he said he was staying at, and he wasn't there. So they, they tracked him down, they arrested him and put him in jail, and he was in jail until the until court after that. And that's when he stopped trying, because that's when he kind of like, I don't even know if he knew it was me that had done that. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't, he probably does now. But, um, you know, sort of like, and that was that was that was the end of it. And then I wrote a victim impact statement that went to the judge. By this stage, I'd done a lot of research into, I, I realized that he was a sociopath, psychopath, psychopath now I realize, but at the time I called it a sociopath. Um, now I can tell you what the difference is. Um, but, uh, and, you know, so I wrote to the, the judge and said, this is how all the crimes tie together because he was going to say he'd married me because I was pregnant, that, you know, he'd, he'd, you know, the, the, yes, he played around, but he was just a bit of a bad lad, you know, so, and that's, you know, the fiance had found out and that's why she'd said that he took, you know, sort of like she gave him permission, but then took the permission away that, mm-hmm. you know, that he's American. So he didn't realize the taser was illegal. You know, he was going to just belittle all these things and sort of separate them off. So they seemed like inconsequential. Don't play everything. So I, I wrote to the judge and I told him everything. And I just said, this is what the scenario is. Um, and I also got really um, slightly hyper fixated on things. So I ended up going through the phone bills and ringing people up that, you know, because I was paying the bills. So I, I had his phone bill and I came across uh, so five fiancés. Um, you know, various businessmen, um, various landlords, et cetera, um, all of which he had conned. Um, you know, so if I came across his um, son in America, um, so he has a son that's now 40. Um, uh, came across, so we know 10 children at a time. Um, you know, sort of like when I went to, it, it just it just goes on and on and on. You were you playing know. investigator because, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming the police wouldn't have gone into this level of, of depth because you had motivation. You wanted yeah. to really nail him to the wall at this point and, yeah. and also make people. I wanted people, to understand. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to get the bigger picture. I wanted to be able to, if you can see the bigger picture, it means you're standing away from it. All right. So when you're in a relationship, particularly a toxic one, if you're in it, Fully. you can't see it. You can always see your friends' toxic relationships, but you can't see your own, right? <laughs> that is great. But... Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like if you can step out of it and yeah. actually see the bigger picture, then then you, you've you got that perspective and you understand what's happening. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to, by talking to all the... I wasn't even thinking about writing a book then. I was just thinking, I need to know. I need to have this information as much as I can, as quick as I can. And, you know, and that, 10 fiancés. I mean, I... I are we saying that the money he was taking from you, he was using in his other situations with other people, and using it to set up other victims? Yeah, I, I know that the um, the otherwise children went to private school. Right. So, in that sense, this web, which is kind of similar to the, the Tinder Swindler story, is you're pulling from this one, you're spending it on that one, yeah. uh, is is kind of what he was doing in that yeah. scenario. Then. He might he might have been giving money to his parents as well. You know, you might pay them for the bloody backup story. It might have been gambling. It might have been doing anything. I mean, doesn't it? it it's just a measure of the control. It's not yeah. really. You know, I don't think that the other wife was living lap of luxury, but they were. I mean, they, lots of kids. So yeah. I mean, not just the, her own, the nannies. And, <laughs> you know, so that there was there was a lot of things what? going on, and uh, they moved every year because you know, although they lived in these big houses, he didn't pay the rent, and so like he would pay the deposit, and and then the the rent wouldn't get paid, and so months would go by, the landlord and constant excuses, oh it's coming, it's coming, there's something wrong with this, something wrong with that, you know, um, and then eventually the landlord would take him to court, and then the day before the court date, he would ring up and say, my wife's just broken her 
leg. Um, and so the court would cancel it and reschedule another month later. And then when he did go to court, he would go, here's a check and he'd give it to the landlord and the judge would go, done deal. Um, and then, you know, so that when the course the check would bounce and then the landlord has to go take them back to court again. So it would take about a year to evict them. So that family were moving every year into mm-hmm. a new property. And she, she fully believed that he was working for MI6. Whoa. So, you know, she she had uh, connections with American intelligence. So he couldn't be a CIA. So he had to say he was MI6 to her. So she she fully believed all this sort of stuff was going on, was very shady deals and stuff like that. Her story is just like a whole nother level to mine. Yeah, it's 10 years on top of that. Mm-hmm. So, so God only knows what else has been yeah. going on. She didn't have any money. So, I mean, the things, it's not my story to tell, but she, you know, the things he did to her make my, my story look like a fairy tale. Mm. So, um, and, and so you're digging, you're doing your digging, you're coming up with more babies, more fiancés, 10 more fiancés. I mean, your, your mind is obviously becoming more and more blown, um, but you want to get this story. And um, what was the purpose of the story at this point? Are you going to try and uh, use this in his court case? Oh. No, when when on my day before my mum died, um, I saw her in hospital and she said, you have to write this down. She said, if this has happened to you, it's happened to someone else. And she said, you know, it just uh, if, if nobody else is standing up and talking about it, you have to be the one that does. Um, so she said, you know, so I'd, I'd walked into a, a bookshop and I said, you know, I've just found out my husband's a bigamist and a con man who's actively impregnating women to rip off money and I want to read a book about it. Mm. And the, the guy behind the counter just went, uh, you know, it's like, I think not been done. Yeah. There isn't a book like that. So, um, I, I after my mum died, I, I went to the Edinburgh Book Festival and did some workshops and then I, I went into a life writing workshop. Um, and before the publisher and the agent got off the stage, or just as they were getting off the stage, I leapt out of my seat and ran down and talked to them. And I said, this is what's happened. And they both gave me their card. And that's now my agent and my first publisher. Um, so I never had to go and pitch it to anyone because no no big Miss Wife had ever written a story about it before because everybody had always been so humiliated and so ashamed of what had happened to them that they wouldn't want to stand up and talk about it. And what made me different is I know I have nothing to be ashamed of. I had that 20 years mm. of shame and I knew there was there was nothing that I'd done other than try to be the best wife I could be and the best mother I could be. And I'd been naive. Um, but I think pretty much anyone who listens to me knows that I'm not stupid. And I knew I wasn't stupid. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if it can happen to me, it could happen to others. So, yeah, so writing writing my first book, The Bigamist, was just like, it was just pure catharsis. You know, it was just three months of this is what I found, this is what happened, and this is what I found out. So at this point, nothing had, uh, sorry, he'd, the, the court case had been and gone, and you knew of other other victims, but you didn't know the full scale of it. Mm-hmm. And that came with the book research yeah. and the more you dug. Yeah. So we're now getting to see the bigger picture now. And... How how big is the picture when you're looking at it in terms of victims, in terms of money, in terms yeah. of people? And you've kind of, you've met some of these people, so yeah. So that the, the at the time I knew five fiancés, two wives. Mm. I knew of uh, a couple of people in America before he came over to the UK with his uh, wife. Um, and so there were there were ten children, um, and about uh, about ten ten eight or nine women, uh-huh. um, and. The there were also the landlords and there was also a couple of businessmen that he'd ripped off for uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah. Um, not to mention the, the other, the um, software company and stuff. Um, the company, the, the company in uh, Manchester uh, that he was announced being in the Times, um, they actually, once once the book came out, once the bigamist came out and I went public with a story, so many people came out of the woodwork, and that company that that he'd been announced as having having worked for in the Times, um, they had gone bust because of him. Wow! Because he he totally destroyed their company, uh, and not least because he actually they gave him a company car, and he drove it to the airport and left it in the short term parking, um, and they I think it, I think they found it like twelve years later. <laughs> no, they didn't know where it was, and they got the 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 you know the company actually got a bill for the for the twelve years of parking short term parking. Wow! And it was worth. I mean, the bill was worth more than the car. Were you speaking to any of these fiancés directly? Yeah, 
Uh, yeah. What was what was those conversations like? And because you're kind of at times the bearer of the bad news, right? And that's not easy to do, you, you know. It, it was incredible. I mean, talking to, for instance, the fiance that brought the charges against him for the fraud that mm. set everything in motion. In fact, because mm. she set up the police sting, so I actually saw her as my savior, and and we're we're still in contact. Um, in fact, it's. It's jumping ahead slightly, but um, you have to shorten this story somehow, don't you? Because I went public with the book and so many be- more people came out of the woodwork. And then it, when he was, he went to jail, he was convicted five years, did two and a half. He was deported straight from jail back to the USA in, in March 20, no, uh, 2nd of March 2009. Um, and he immediately started doing it again. So there's now all the new victims from America. So within within nine months, I was contacted by three new people, one of which was pregnant, um, and you know, sort of like two others who had been ripped off for money. Um, then he went quiet for a few years, changed his name, did some other things, and I got contact by a whole new raft of people, mm. uh, including one lady called Michelle Lewis, and she's amazing. She's like my we're like two pillars either side of the Atlantic that kind of have kept this this community of women going. So we created a Facebook group. Wow. And we had 21 victims on it at one point. Uh-huh. And, you know, sort of like, and, and it's got a lot less now, but, you know, we were just this community of people who came together just talking about this same man and knowing, and that catharsis of knowing that it's not just me. Mm-hmm. He didn't do this to me because of who I am. Mm-hmm. He did this to me because of who he is. Yes. And it's like a cat playing with a mouse. It's nothing to do with the mouse. Mm-hmm. It's just the cat's game, you know, and it's, it's not personal. And, and actually finding out that he was a different person with each of us as well, mm-hmm. you know, and all that kind of jazz. We actually, we actually mapped out where he was when, which is how I know he wasn't, he wasn't in Edinburgh when, you know, he said, come and pick, pick me up. I know he was in Oxford because I know he was there then, you know, sort of like, it's how I know, you know, what he was doing to his feet, you know, and there's, I mean, there's so much more to this, um, you know, sort of like different aspects we can talk about, but, you know, the, the behavior we were able to map and see what, what he was doing and when and how and, you know, how he was overlapping with things. Did any of the women report anything like physically abusive or any more of the is- issues with children or whatever, anything like that? There was there was no other issues of any kind of um, sexual assault on children, certainly. I think he learned his lesson with that one. Um, I think he realised that was the biggest mistake he ever made, um, logically, mm-hmm. um, because that's that's followed him and that's, 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 a, that's a one he can't excuse, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but the yeah, certainly the, there was one one relationship we had where you had someone up by the throat against the wall kind of thing uh, and would have explosive anger um, and stuff. But again, I think it's just because that's what worked in that relationship. Intimidation was something mm-hmm. that actually worked in that relationship. And how I, much money did he drain from these other women, do you think? I think I was the one that, that, that lost the most. Um, I mean, it wasn't just the, the £198,000. Um, once this, the dust cleared, it also turned out he'd taken credit cards out of my name. So I was actually left with £56,000 worth of debt. That was fun. Because um, that was that, I mean, for for months afterwards, I was getting phone calls from people going, you need to pay this credit card debt. And I was going, as I told you yesterday, you know, this is my, you know, taking out my husband, took it out in my name. It's in my name. I had no, you know, husbands can do that. I, I think we'd taken out one credit card and he like forged the others. Are you, um, are you still liable for that, even though it's a crime that he did? No, I sold, I sold my story to the Daily Mail um, in, you know, sort of 2006 when it was all going to court and they gave me £8,000 and we put that into a pot and said to all these people, you can take pennies in the pound or you can wait years and get five pounds a week kind of thing uh, or five pounds a month. On, you know, so and they took it. So I was actually out of debt within six months. Thank God. But yeah, so it was it was a great relief for that. But, you know, it was, it, yeah. One of the hardest things I had to do was go to my mum and say, you have to cut me out of the will because it's like, otherwise it's just going to all go to his debts. Mm. And it's like, that was tough. But um, That is brutal. Mm. Like, right in there but like you know thank i mean look thank god you uh you navigated this situation really well for all uh you've talked about you know trying not to feel shame for what you went through uh the way you handled it when you had your eyes opened Mm. 
you you investigated, you were brave, mm. uh, smart, you connected the dots, you brought other people in, you made it as hard for him to do this again as humanly possible. So you got to take credit in that. Yeah, but it's not, it, I, I want to make something quite clear. None of that was done out of revenge, mm. right? No, I don't, I don't hate him. I don't even actually dislike him. I know this sounds really weird, right? I, I actually feel nothing for him. But what I do want to do is to try and protect future victims. You know, I want, I want to educate people so that they understand, so that they don't fall for the same thing I did. You know, people think that the red flag in a relationship is when they ask you for money, right? So you've got to be watching. You know, they asked you for money, or that's or you're already too late. By the time they ask you for money, you are already hooked. They've but, set you up for that moment. Yeah. The groundwork's been done. Yeah. So it's like the, the, in understanding that the red flags are actually the, the love bombing, that actually when you're taking you slightly off balance, when they're slightly, there's all sorts of techniques, and I actually talk about them in the book, but there's all sorts of techniques that they use where you, feeling they're, you feel they're building you up and actually what they're doing is knocking you down. They're knocking your self-confidence constantly so you feel that the only person who actually has your back is them. The feeling of being yo-yoed is for sure. Like, I, mm. you can meet a guy and he can, quote unquote, like, I know the love bombing is a specific technique, but he can be really nice to you, over the top nice to you. But if he's always that and he's never, you, you aren't getting the yo-yo, then you're probably fine. Yeah. Like, he's just being a good guy. But it, like you say, it's this this feeling of the state that he keeps you in, of not knowing what the hell's coming next is is where you don't know where you stand. Um, but... Um, was there any other shocking things that happened throughout these investigative uh, things that you did? I don't know. So many. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think one that I think you've got quite a lot of male listeners. So you, that they might like this one is that um, uh, one of his partners actually didn't want to have any more children. So she said she'd have her tubes tied. Um, and he said, no, no, darling, that's, that's too invasive. You know, I'll go and have a vasectomy instead. So he went away and came back with what looked like two cigarette burns out of the side of his testes. And strangely enough, she got pregnant again. Fucking hell. This guy burned his own balls for a story. Twice. Wow. The psychopaths don't have any empathy for themselves any more than they do anybody else, right? Yeah. So the main difference, I think, between a psychopath and a narcissist is a psychopath doesn't care about anybody, including themselves, whereas a narcissist doesn't care about anyone except themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, he even though he felt that pain the first time, um, he doesn't care that his future self is going to feel that pain again in a few seconds. So they, they, you know, they just don't care about the future. It's like you might, you might go out tonight and, and, and have a drink, but you've got something to do tomorrow. So you won't because you don't want to have the hangover, you know? So you, you care about your future self, right? They don't, uh -huh. they don't care. It's like that person's not done anything for them. Why would they do anything, you know, for this future? It's self? so like shark like, isn't it? Like yeah. Predatory. Um, that's why they don't mind kind of go it's not that they don't mind but they expect to go to jail at some point you know they know they're going to get caught eventually because they're going to keep pushing the boundaries until they yeah. do like they, like they, the, the Ted Bundys of this world like they, they will continue to do what they do um, no matter what happens and, and do you know where he is now? I do well Actually, this this year has been amazing because it's like the, I actually got to go to America with filming the documentary. Oh wow! So uh, my daughter and I flew to to America and we met some of the other victims. So I mean, I've been talking to some of these people for like fourteen years, oh. um, and you know, but we've and we've talked online and we we're we're really close. I mean, it, talking them through new relationships. You know, we understand the the issues that that each other has to explain this. Yeah, and so they don't have to kind of talk about the background. It's like, oh my god, I'm going on a date. You know, they've done this. Am I being oversensitive? You know, um, and you know, so we've we've supported each other. You know, people have gone off and got married and had children, and and we're still supporting each other. You know, um, and you know, so to be able to go over to America and meet them, and um, but we also awesomely the production actually helped get a private detective um because one thing i've always said is like doesn't matter where he is he will be committing some crime um so, so, so true yeah, yeah and uh and we were successful so and uh, so yes he is currently currently residing in jail waiting trial again wow so what um, for this time uh I, I larceny um check fraud <laughs> um you know variety of things as usual yeah. you know but uh yeah and so i mean it was just it was amazing and it was just it, 
you know, just meeting meeting Michelle and, you know, some of the Evelyn, Evelyn and some of the others. There was, out of the 21 victims I know, only five wanted to be on the documentary series. So, yeah. you know... Which I, you can't blame I, them. I understand. Yeah. yeah. But... Um, yeah, it was it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool that the the five of us actually did sit, sit and speak. But yeah, it's it's a it's a sisterhood. I don't know how to describe it. It's yeah. just there, you know. We all the, there's none of us sitting there going, "You were with my man," you know. Uh. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's just like, you know, we're all we're all sort of really supportive of each other. So it's an incredible feeling to actually be able to stand and actually hug them. And now your goal coming out of this is to better educate other people so that they can spot these red flags yes. uh, early enough so that you don't get into that situation where these are they're then asking you for money and all of that yeah. stuff so how has that been for you it's amazing I'm a, a part of a I'm actually on the board of advisors for an organization called psychopathy is which is an international organization of neuroscientists and specialists in in psychopathy I don't know why I'm you know it's sort of like just I, I, I I'm got no qualifications in it, but just the no, you are qualified. I've done. But um, <laughs> yeah. and one of the things that that you know we really need to do. I mean, society has to do is that one percent of society full blown psychopaths, four percent of CEOs, twenty five percent of the prison population. These are all sort of statistics you can think of, right? But you're not allowed to diagnose somebody as a psychopath until they're eighteen, right? By which time they're cooked. Right. Just because somebody has lack of empathy, guilt, and remorse does not make them a bad person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. It makes them have the capacity to do anything. Right. We need to be able to diagnose people, children as, with psychopathy because the, there are a lot of them and they cause is the, the damage they do to society. Will Jordan has done so much damage, millions and millions of pounds worth of financial damage, but also he is creating people, people have committed suicide over what he's done. Um, people really? have, yes. And, and it's not just the partners and the children. It's the, it's the stepchildren that, I mean, I had a, I had a daughter, he targets single mothers, you know, so it's the sisters, the brothers, the mums, the dads, that, that it, goes off like a bomb in a community, this person. So 1% of society are not affecting the just 100 people in their lifetime. It's a ripple effect, yeah. And is they're affecting thousands. Yeah. So the chances of you not having met a psychopath in your lifetime are pretty much zero. All right. And they affect people. They, they, they really do damage in society. So if we can actually target, you know, children and say, okay, this child is show showing and, and the first sign of psychopathy is fearlessness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they don't care about the consequences. Mm -hmm. So the, the children who are completely fearless, they're, they're the ones that you're actually going to go, okay, that is a, a red flag. But if we can say that, okay, rather than saying, you know, little Johnny, you know, if you do that, you're going to hurt mommy's feelings because that means nothing to them, or you're going to be in trouble later on. You know, if we can actually cut, find a different way of bringing those children up so they become, you know, have a good moral code and actually understand their condition, then they won't necessarily become monsters in society. And, go, and going back to you, you said someone who committed suicide. Mm. Uh, who, who was that? It was uh, one of their nannies. Wow. So, yeah. And, and, just, it's, and, and, just... and by the way, now I know 14 children Oh. By eight different women with the with this, the new children being born in America as well since his release, um, and you know so the yeah twenty one victims fourteen children, a whole load of landlords and business people as well, um, you know so there's sort of like within within that sort of community I mean I know of you know fifty odd people who who he has affected their lives dramatically, mm. you know it's like that's that's just. And that's the tip of the iceberg. I reckon there's probably more likely to be about 40 children because those are just the ones that have come forward since I went public, have come forward and said, actually, me too. Yeah, I mean, how many people who was he operating under a different name with who will never, ever even hear of this? Yeah, or don't, or don't you know, they don't know what happened to him mm -hmm. or, or don't even, you know, or know and don't want to be connected. They don't want to know any, anyone else to know. I mean, as I say, the girl in Japan that was 1997, mm. um, she she saw uh, an NBC Dateline program that me and Michelle did years ago. Um, they're still doing the rounds and she saw it, uh, I think, in Germany or something. Um, and uh, she, she she got in touch and said, oh, my gosh, you know. I knew I would see a thing about him one day, you know, and gave us, you know, pieces of information that we didn't have before as well about that that mm. time period. Um, so, yeah, she's part of the group now. I think it's good that you uh, said that you don't hate him and that mm. he doesn't have that hold on you and you've just let go because that, 
you know, while you're still living with that feeling, you can never really be free of it, right? Yeah, so that's exactly. great that you've got at that point mentally. Yeah. I don't I don't even wish him I don't wish him harm or anything else. Mm. I, I'm glad he's behind bars because I mean we've just literally freed another victim. You know, so that that was that was somebody that that was in America that he was still abusing for want of a better word oh. um, so you know she now at least can get on with her life and try and sort of repair things so it's not about enacting revenge on him and you know I want him in jail because I'm vindictive or anything but doing that means that she's now free mm -hmm. doing that means that all those people in America can rest easy I can rest easy because he, he's not allowed back in the country mm -hmm. you know but the people in America like Michelle you know she's got she, she can he could be around any corner mm. you know so but she can rest easy whilst he's in jail knowing that, that she's not going to bump into him so it's it's more about sort of as I say protecting the victims than it is about any vindictiveness mm. against him. He used to be he used to be a really really good con man. He's not he's not so good anymore. He's getting older and he's getting less uh, desirable as well, right? Yeah. Like part of the charm is you know a certain look, a certain attitude, and yeah. But he's also I mean he's he's not just getting older, but he's actually I think it's me. I'm I've made it quite hard for him. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You That's definitely right. have. I want one last mention of your book. If anyone wants to purchase it, I'm going to put the link in the description below. Mary Turner Thompson, the psychopath: a true story. Uh, if you want to know in even more detail, uh, all of those specific memories are in there. And obviously, the documentary is going to be on what channel? It's on ITVX uh, and SCV Player, and it's called "The Other Mrs. Jordan: Catching the Ultimate Con Man." Very good. Well, I'll definitely check that out as well uh, in full. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mary uh, on the True Geordie podcast, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well done.